Hello, 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 and welcome to a Wednesday evening live stream. My name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and the channel that you're watching this on is Natalie Lawyer Chick. Nice to meet all of you if you are new here. And I would like to welcome our very esteemed guest, Ian, aka Runkle of the Bailey. Hi, Ian. Welcome. Hey, how are you doing? Good, good. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to talk to you. Um, you know, Ian is a Canadian attorney. Uh, he has a lot of great insights, especially on gun related issues. And we are going to be talking about the Alec Baldwin uh, shooting on the set of the movie Rust, um, in which uh, one of the uh, employees was killed, another was injured. And Hannah Gutierrez Reed was the armorer that was hired. And she was convicted of manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter. Is yeah. that right? Yeah, involuntary yeah. manslaughter um, just recently uh, in relation to her improper handling of her you know, job as the armorer to check the safety of the weapon that was used. It was supposed to not be firing live rounds. It was only supposed to be firing blanks. Is blanks the right word to use? Uh, they were supposed to have loaded it with dummies. And, dummies. Um, I guess I can show you the difference. I've actually got some yeah. here. Please. Um, so uh, a blank looks like this, uh, typically with sort of a crimped end. Mm -hmm. And that's because it contains powder, but no, um, no projectile. So nothing that should be able to fly out. Whereas a dummy is made to look like a real cartridge. And this is actually a film dummy that I got from Movie Armaments Group. Okay. Uh, these ones have a punched out primer, but not all film dummies do because sometimes you might have a close up loading scene or something, or you mm -hmm. might need to be able to see that. Um, but the dummies that they had were supposed to have this where they're supposed to, uh, you know, sort of have a BB in them that rattles. Mm -hmm. Although some of them all, some of them instead just had a hole drilled in the side of the case. So uh, dummies are used in situations where you might want to, get a close-up view either of a gun like a revolver where you can see the rounds in it uh, when it's being held or uh, if you're doing a scene like a loading scene or something like that um, then you may need you may need it to look real but whereas blanks are used for those uh, scenes where you know you see John Wick shoot three people and there's a, a bang each time that's mm -hmm. what they're using blanks for in those uh... so there was there's never uh, there should never be live ammo on mm -hmm. a film set for a fictional film like this. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very the one exception for when you might have live ammo is if you're doing something like high speed photography for like a Mythbusters or something. Mm -hmm. But there it's going to be very um, it's a very unique situation. And that would be you're never going to have that mixed with like pointing the gun at a camera or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. it's not going to happen on the set of a film like Rust. So there should never have been live ammo there. And that's going to be a key part of Baldwin's uh, defense is like, hey, um, there wasn't supposed to be live ammo. So how am I getting in trouble for there having been live ammo on this set? Right. Right. And that's still a question even after Gutierrez Reed's trial. It's not clear that it was. It, it wasn't necessarily proven who it was that brought the live rounds onto set. Is is that a fair assessment? That's how I took it. That, you know, people had their suspicions. Maybe it was this guy. Maybe it was her. Maybe it was someone else. But I don't see any definitive proof as to who brought the live rounds onto the set. No. And Hannah was apparently offered a deal. And we know this from uh, Bowles. Uh that if she was to tell them who who brought the live ammo, that they would cut her a break and mm -hmm. or the original source of the live ammo. It's pretty sure that Hannah was the source of the live ammo. But mm -hmm. the question is, where does Hannah get it? Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that that was Thel Reed. But mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's my feeling on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's her dad you're talking about. That's her dad, who mm -hmm. was a legendary armor, who's now, uh, I think, basically retired. Yeah. And uh, so he, A, was a great armor, but or was sort of a, a famous armor. I don't know about great. Uh, there's mm -hmm. 
I keep hearing you know a variety of things there, but sure. one of the things he was also notable for was being um, sort of good at, with trick handling of firearms. So you'd see him being able to do like gun like twirling. Doc Holiday. Like if you if you go and see an old western, you'll often see a clip where it like zooms in on your hero, and you see them like whip around a gun and twirl mm -hmm. it and so forth, and then. And that is almost always, that was Del Reed's hands, typically. Oh, uh, so was it, I wonder if it was Del Reed in Tombstone, where, do you did you ever see Tombstone? It's like a great movie. Oh, it's so a I'm, classic. Yeah, yeah, classic movie. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Doc Holliday is, you know, gambling and drunk and sick from his TB and all types of stuff. And uh, this uh, the guy that was like, his version on the other side with the bad guys uh, like does all the little gun tricks and everything. And then Doc Holliday takes out the cup and does all the tricks with the cup and then diffuses the situation. You remember that scene? That's one of my favorite scenes in a movie. It's it's a great scene. And yeah. uh, I, I don't know if it was Thel Reed who did Tombstone. Now I'm just mm -hmm. trying to pull up uh, his IMDB because. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it just, yeah. it was, it would really fit that circumstance because that was really intricate handwork with that gun, you know? So I, I never forgot that. That always, um, uh, uh, that always sticks in my mind. So if that is him, that would be a point of reference for me. Uh, he um, was the armorer on tombstone. Yes. Oh, so maybe those are his hands. Okay. Interesting. It very, may very well interesting. be. Yep. Okay. Uh, and if it wasn't, then he probably taught the person who, uh, who did that. So, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So thank, thank you so much for kind of helping me to conceptualize those things. Where we are right now, Ian, is that Alec Baldwin is heading into trial. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed has been found guilty. And he is, his attorneys have filed a motion uh, to dismiss the indictment, which is the charging document that was brought to the grand jury. And as we were talking about before we started the stream, for me, this is unique because in Maryland, a grand jury is a sealed proceeding. It's uh, non-adversarial. It's all slanted towards the prosecution. It's allowed to be that way because it's a probable cause analysis. And there's no input from the defense unless the prosecution seeks it. But it seems like here it was ordered by the court and there may be specific New Mexico law that would have ordered them to present the mitigating case for Alec Baldwin at the grand jury. They've actually got a, a weird process. Uh, and I say weird, uh, I think it's a good process. Like as a defense lawyer, um, we don't have grand juries really here, but if we mm -hmm. did, I would want the New Mexico rules. I'd want those oh, New yes. Mexico procedures Absolutely, because, um, in order to do it, they have to send uh, Baldwin a target letter, mm -hmm. which basically says you are the target of a grand jury investigation. Mm -hmm. Here's your rights. And from there, he's actually got a right to submit like an alert letter to say, this is information that you guys need to consider. Mm -hmm. And then the prosecution, if they don't want to tender that, actually has to bring a an application in court to say, we don't want to tender this evidence. Right. And so that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out. I haven't been able to sort of dig into the case law because it's tough to sort of find the case law as to whether anything else has been thrown out. But sure, certainly that's what Baldwin is arguing is that uh, they're saying that this should be thrown out. And that I think is going to be... Um, it's going to be exceptional to see what happens. Right. Absolutely. Let's make it very, very clear. I know that you guys don't have grand juries, but you still have probable cause charging, whether that's by, you know, the prosecutor, the police officer. I'm sure you guys have some form of how the case gets charged in the first place. Right. Basically, the uh, the police officer would swear, uh, you know, an information, mm -hmm. which uh, and it doesn't have to be a police officer, but it's almost always a police officer. Mm -hmm. And that just says, you know, we believe that, uh, you know, that there's reasonable grounds to charge this person with, you know, with these offenses. Sure. There's a procedure for uh, what's called a preliminary inquiry, mm -hmm. which is 
not like a grand jury, but it's um, similar in the sense that the test is whether there's some evidence mm -hmm. to allow things to go to a jury. But um, that process has really been narrowed down. So a lot of charges that you used to have a right to a prelim on, you don't anymore. Okay. So, um, which is unfortunate because the prelim mm -hmm. used to be a good way to... Uh, 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 a prelim was sort yeah. of a mini trial. So mm -hmm. we could do things like say, I want to hear from this witness. And you'd have a chance to... Um, either elicit information so that it's a place where you could ask those questions that uh, you don't know the answer to. Yeah. And say like, Hey, um, before it's the actual trial before mm -hmm. the, the risk is there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also sometimes see how a witness is going to hold up. I've had times where you push a, a witness a little bit and, mm -hmm. um, and then they, they start apart. to fall apart. Yeah. The prosecution's like, yeah, we're not going. <laughs> <laughs> know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so before we move, we're we're gonna uh, deep dive as much as possible into this document. But before we move into that document, let me just kind of compare and contrast Maryland system with Canada system with New Mexico system, kind of when it comes to charging cases. So similar to what you said, Ian, we have for our misdemeanor charges. Those are. Uh, they can be charged two, two or three ways, right? Misdemeanor charges. A civilian can just go to a commissioner and say, Ian punched me in the face and then Ian is charged with assault. And then that <laughs> you, that's it. Like literally, that's it. You just swear under the penalties of perjury that someone has attacked you or stolen from you or done something to you. And if it's a misdemeanor, you just show up on your first court date <laughs> right. And you'll have to, you know, deal with whatever happens then. It's a really crazy char uh, charging system. And I just want to say that no hate to our commissioners, but commissioners are not even lawyers. Uh, mm -hmm. Commissioners have really no minimum level of education that they need in order to be a commissioner. And then they just charge people. So they just listen to what you say and then they swear out the charges. Another form of charging. And that would be district court cases, would be police officers who can charge initially both misdemeanors and felonies on what's called a, well, you can swear out a felony on a, on a, um, on a uh, commissioner charge complaint, but it's just not as likely. There'll, there'll be some type of intervention from law enforcement. Usually you, you can't walk to the commissioner after a felony assault's been committed on you, right? But when you have- <laughs> Hey, I've, and, I've been nearly murdered. Like, right? you know, this person cut my throat and instead of right? going to the hospital, I'm going to exactly. a commissioner. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. There's no prohibition on seeing a commissioner for that, but it's just really unlikely. More than likely, the police are getting involved by now, right? <laughs> the commissioner's so they, like- um, can you stop bleeding on my property, yeah. please? <laughs> please, please, sir. <laughs> Go to the police. <laughs> so the police can charge under a statement of probable cause, right? So a statement of probable cause, they can charge misdemeanors, felonies, and they just swear on an affidavit, essentially, that they are telling the truth and that they have probable cause to believe that this crime has been committed. And if it's only a district court misdemeanor, you'll just go to court and go through the whole process of court based on what this officer charged you with. Now, if you get charged with a felony by a police officer on a statement of probable cause, so say you have a, a mixture of misdemeanors and felonies, which is very common that you're charged with, you would then go to um, a preliminary hearing similar to your preliminary inquiry. But and just like what you said, where it's limited what you can get a preliminary inquiry for, you can only get a preliminary hearing for felonies and you, I don't think you can get them for felony thefts. You cannot get a preliminary hearing for a felony theft, but other types of felonies you can get a preliminary hearing for. If the judge finds that there's probable cause, your case goes to circuit court, the state files an information in the circuit court, your case goes forward. If the judge does not find that there's probable cause, the felonies must be dismissed. And then you can go on to uh, your misdemeanor charges in district court. 
And then the final and most serious way of being charged is in front of a grand jury, which the defense gets no input into. And it's very rare that the prosecution ever asks for defense input. The only time they ever do it is when they are indicting a police officer. Then they'll <laughs> call them, right? It's, that's the only time it ever happens. I, it's like, it's so wild to me. They're like, oh, they could not secure an indictment. And I'm like, how? In the state of Maryland, you don't even have to have witnesses testify at a grand jury. You can just have them read the statement of probable cause that was written by the police officer and use that as the basis. And in many counties like mine, they don't even take live testimony at a grand jury. So it's essentially a rubber stamp unless they don't want to get the, you know, the charge. So this is blowing my mind. Which means police officer. <laughs> police officers, right? That's the only time they don't want to get an indictment. And so if they indict a police officer, that police officer was really, really bad, right? Because <laughs> despite the prosecutor's best efforts. Now, I will I, let me not be too mean. There are some counties like mine that have like police accountability units that are separate mm. from the general prosecutor's office. And they do work really hard on securing indictments but that's not standard that's not required and many times there's a lot of commingling and you know capture basically so yeah all right so let's move on to see how new mexico differs from what i know what ian knows and um stop me at any time ian um if there's anything that jumps out to you because this will be my first time reading this this thing now, it might um, be worth starting with the statute. Do you have that? Okay, let's, uh, let me, I can, but let me find it. Hold on, let's get to it. Uh, once we come upon the statute, I will pull it up. Does I, uh, sense? or do you have I'll it? drop a link there. Oh, drop a link, even better. Let's do that. I see ya. Oh, no. I see ya, I see ya. So we will... Stop sharing and because one of them was external. Share screen. Grand jury proceedings. New Mexico rule of criminal procedure. District court 5-302.2. Grand jury proceedings. Timing upon filing of the criminal complaint. Um, they shall be scheduled and held with. Okay. We don't need the filing. The timing. I mean. Extensions. Blah, blah. Notice to target. Okay. That's the key bit. That's the key bit. Yeah. Cause I'm like, uh, yeah, they have a time limit. Okay. Content. The prosecuting attorney assisting the grand jury shall notify the target. <laughs> this is so wild to me. Notify right? the target of a grand jury. I wish that Maryland was like that, but it is not. <laughs> You must notify the target of a grand jury investigation in writing that the person is the target of an investigation. The writing shall notify the target of the nature of the crime being investigated, the date of the alleged crime, any applicable statutory citations. Thank you, honey. I appreciate you. Go with. No, see, now she's going to just want to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Okay, sorry. The applicable statutory citations, the target's right to testify, the target's right not to testify, the target's right to submit exculpatory evidence to the district attorney for a presentation to the grand jury, and their right to the assistance of counsel during the grand jury investigation. Okay, I just want to stop right here um, before it slips my mind. I'm seeing here, and I'm sure that it'll, it'll, they'll expand on it more in the statute, but you have the right to give them your mitigating information, the right to testify, and you must yep. be notified. But does that mean that the state is, like, do they have to present that to the grand jury just because the defendant has the right to give those things to the prosecution? Uh, check section C that answers a evidence. lot of those questions. Okay, let's, yep. let's answer those questions. Lawful, competent, and relevant evidence. All evidence presented shall be lawful, competent, and relevant, but the rules of evidence shall not apply. Okay. Same thing with grand juries in Maryland. The rules of evidence don't apply. Exculpatory evidence. They shall alert the grand jury to all lawful, competent, and relevant evidence that disproves or reduces a charge or accusation, or that makes an indictment unjustified, and that is within the knowledge, possession, or control of the prosecuting attorney. Evidence and defenses submitted by target. If the target submits written notice to the prosecuting attorney of exculpatory evidence, um, 
uh, or a relevant defense, the prosecuting attorney shall alert the grand jury to the existence of the evidence. Um, it shall consist of a factual and non-argumentative description of the nature of any tangible evidence and the potential testimony of any witness. And when they say exculpatory, they mean they mean tends to lessen guilt, basically in this context, because it could also mean lessen punishment, but tends to lessen guilt. Um, okay, I think okay. Okay, review of prosecutor's decision not to alert grand jury to target evidence or defenses. The prosecuting attorney assisting the grand jury may only be relieved of the duty to alert the grand jury to the target's evidence or defenses by obtaining a court order before the grand jury proceeding. Oh, the prosecuting attorney shall file a motion under seal with the grand jury judge with written notice to the target stating why the target submitted evidence is not exculpatory as defined in subparagraph two of this paragraph or stating why the target's grand jury evidence alert letter and cover letter shall be, at, uh, sorry, uh, the grand jury should not be instructed on the target's requested defenses. A copy of the target's grand jury evidence alert level, lever, letter and cover letter <laughs> shall be attached to the motion. The target may file under seal a response to the motion. And if no response is filed, the grand jury judge may ask the target for a written response to be filed under seal and may convene a hearing. The burden is on the prosecuting attorney to show that the, pro the proposed evidence is not exculpatory as defined in the subparagraph. Uh, the grand jury judge will give the prosecuting attorney clear direction on how to proceed before the grand jury makes a, re a record of the decision. Okay. Wow. This is blowing my mind. Ian, I want to hear your thoughts first. Wow. It's to me, it's just wild that the, uh, I mean, it's wild and good that the defense gets to say, listen, you've got to, you've got to show them. Like if you want to have them say, my client needs to face charges for this, you got to show them, you know, here's, a bunch of things I want you to tell them before you go ahead, before they go ahead and make that decision. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is absolutely how it should be. It's just, that isn't how it usually is in most places. Right. Um, right. I, I that, wish it was like this in my state. I really, really do. I'm so jealous. Yeah. I'm like, why don't we have this everywhere? But it is very unique. And that's going to be the basis of the uh, sort of complaint here is mm -hmm. um, basically going, you had an obligation to do these things and you didn't do them. So you're on the hook for not doing them. Right. And that I think is going to be really fascinating because I don't really know how these things work. Like I Me don't, either. I've never dealt with this before. Me either. And, and I, I yeah. let me see, is there a remedy provision in here? One more time. Let me just pull this up. Like, what does the statute say? What is the remedy for the prosecutor not doing those things? If in fact it's proven that the prosecution didn't do it. Um, I don't see a remedy, although mm -hmm. there are some, uh, there are apparently some cases of, because um, they cite some of the cases. And so one of the cases they've got cited below mm -hmm. is uh, State versus Pareo. Mm -hmm. where um, they didn't let the person testify. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they uh, they quashed the indictment. Wow. So wow. And if they quash this indictment, then that's it. Baldwin is, uh, you know, he's out. He's done. Why? Is there a statute of limitations or something? Why couldn't they re-indict presenting his uh, exculpatory evidence to the grand jury? I don't think they can when it's the second try, but I'll have to, uh, mm -hmm. cause this is not their first kick at the can. Right. That's right. They did, uh, drop the case initially. Uh, you know, I had some issues with that. Ian, I think we were talking about a little bit on Twitter that I thought it was a little sloppy leading up to this thing. And it was like weird to me that they were, um, they were at some, um, like city meeting or something like that. And they were asking for more funding and they cited the Baldwin case as one of the reasons that they needed more funding to do more investigation. And then they turned around and dropped the case. I always, that never sat right with me, but, um, if well, this a major, is... um, a major issue and they're going to raise it in this motion to, uh, in the motion to dismiss here, mm -hmm. but a major issue with why this case was dropped was that apparently Baldwin's team, 
uh, brought in something to suggest that uh, that this gun had been filed down. And so then the prosecution ended up getting another expert in to be like, mm -hmm. hey, is this actually what was going on or is this, you know, BS? Mm -hmm. And that expert came back to say, this is just BS. This uh, there's no way it could have fired without it, uh, without the trigger having been pulled. Mm -hmm. And when that report came out, I, I did a video basically saying Baldwin's getting charged again. Yeah. And uh, a few people online said basically, no, he's, you know, he's free. He's done. He's not mm -hmm. getting charged again. Mm hmm. And then sure enough, he was charged again because, of charged. course, he was charged again. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, he shot that, a gun that killed somebody. So, you know, of course, if, he's going to be charged again. Yeah, and if that report had come back saying, hey, it wasn't his fault, then I don't think we'd have seen anything. But that's not how that right. report shook out. Interesting. Okay. All right. So there is no, that I can see, it. there is no prescribed remedy outside of... um it's reviewable by the district court, right? Yeah. Um, so failure to follow the procedures is reviewable by the district court. It doesn't say in the statute what the district court should do, but that would then give, um, if it's like in judicial discretion or whatever as a standard, that would give the, the judge the right to do almost anything. Um, so we'll see. And But it's hard to imagine sort of what remedies they could apply that aren't uh, quashing the indictment. Right. What like, there's nothing that would fix that. That you yeah, know, like, you had what, exculpatory evidence, you failed to present it. I don't see anything that would really fix that. So it could very well be that um, you know, the Baldwin ends up walking because of that. And mm -hmm. um that'd be awkward. <laughs> that would be real awkward, especially with all of the media attention that went into this case. Um, and that was courted by the prosecuting office. All right. I'm going to pull up the I'm going to let you out, Jazz. Don't you worry. I am going <laughs> to pull up the uh, motion to dismiss. And real quick, uh, I am going to let my dog out. <laughs> she wants out. She wants at her dad. Um, just give me one second. Dog Maybe is like, escape. <laughs> yeah. Free me. <laughs> okay. One second. <laughs> Uh, while you're gone, I could probably read the uh, preliminary statement here just uh, so that awesome. people aren't. Uh... <laughs> hey. Hey, so yeah, go ahead. preliminary statement, nothing is more central to our system of justice than a fair and impartial jury. As Thomas Jefferson put it, trial by jury is the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which government can be held to the principles of its constitution. So too for the grand jury. The grand jury is our system's foundation for the protection of individual rights and a recognized method by which the public can be certain of protection against abuse of public responsibilities. And that's uh, Baird versus State. Uh, the prosecutors obtained the indictment against Alec Baldwin by circumventing this fundamental protection over, period, and over, period, and over again, period. Ooh, dramatic, dramatic. <laughs> yeah, they really start off with the poetry on this one. I mean, mm -hmm. it's quotations, but I always sort of describe this as like, argument by poetry where it's like mm -hmm. eh, we're gonna I find it's often I I don't know my own sort of biases is it often signals to me that the other side doesn't have a lot mm -hmm. um, I love when the prosecution files something and they uh, they start off like this because I'm like you got nothing <laughs> that's if right you you'd file something and not poetry. Right, so. right. You would get to the point of what it is that you have. <laughs> but I, I'm a big I'm a big fan of a flourishy language. So so let's see. Let's see how this sticks out. I'm less a flourishy person. I'm like, mm. I'm just going to go uh, straight to it and be like, here's why the other side should lose. <laughs> <laughs> I like a good piece of prose now. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, so a certain bit is stylistic, but mm -hmm. there's a couple lawyers that I was up against a fair bit just because sometimes you end up sort of matched up with somebody. Mm -hmm. And every time they wrote something that was like clear and to the point, I lost every time they started with poetry. <laughs> I won. You won. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> you want me to pick up here? Ah, sounds good. 
Okay, so the criminal case against Baldwin started in January 2023 when the Wall Street Journal called Baldwin's attorneys to inform them for the first time that Alec Baldwin was being prosecuted for involuntary manslaughter. Immediately after, the state announced the decision publicly and went on a viral press tour to tell the world that Baldwin was guilty and faced a mandatory minimum five-year prison sentence. The state's approach came by surprise. The state had promised to inform Baldwin well in advance of making such a decision. It also posted on Facebook the day before that it would be making a somber and respectful announcement of its charging decision without making any public appearances. It broke those promises. The state's unethical disparagement of Alec Baldwin was a sign of things to come. <laughs> the state violated the ex post facto clauses of the U.S. and New Mexico constitutions by charging Baldwin with a firearm enhancement that had not been enacted when the accident occurred. First of all, I uh, am digging the whole saying accident, right? Because they are defense. And so they're saying this is not a manslaughter. This is not a murder. This was an accident, right? An accident can still be a manslaughter, by the way, especially involuntary. If you are uh, doing something extremely dangerous and even you accidentally kill somebody, that can be manslaughter. But still, I like the language there. Yeah, I mean, a sort of classic example that people get charged for all the time is uh, you get some idiot is like, uh, you know, hey, let's have my friend ride on the top of my car. And um, oh, God, <laughs> you know, and then they get into an accident because, of course, you do that when your friend is driving like an idiot. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then people do get charged. And it's like, well, why was I charged? It's an accident. Yeah, it's an accident that happened because you did a stupid thing. That's right. So. That's right. You didn't set out to kill anybody, but because you did something stupid or dangerous, you killed someone and accident or not, that's what you are liable for. Real quick, Ian, before we continue this, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of the new members and for all of you who have gifted members. I'm just going to briefly, I, I don't want you to think I'm not noticing you guys turning up in the comment section. You're gifting so many memberships. Thank you so, so much. So I'm just going to say your names real, real quick. J. Michael RN, thank you so much for gifting 50 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. Thank you, Marvin CZ, for gifting 10 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. And thank you, Ryan Blackhawk, for gifting five Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, what is that? 65 new members already in this live stream that were gifted. There were some other of you that have joined on your own. Don't worry. At the very end, I'm going to thank all of you individually and more in depth. But I see you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. So... The state's unethical disparagement of Baldwin was a sign of things to come. The state violated the ex post facto clauses of the Constitution by charging Baldwin with a firearm enhancement that had not been enacted when the accident occurred. It's important to note that you cannot charge somebody for something that was not a crime when it happened. OK, so that's what they're saying. The district attorney, Mary Carmack, Alt Altvice. Altwees appointed special prosecutor Andrea Reeb to pursue Baldwin, even though she was simultaneous, simultaneously running for a seat in the New Mexico legislature. That doesn't matter. Reeb told Carmack Altwees in a private email exchange that she wanted Carmack Altwees to announce her involvement in the prosecution because it would help her election campaign. That may matter. <laughs> Why would you say that? <laughs> Um, like because not very smart <laughs> right you can think something in your mind without committing it in writing because you should not be prosecuting somebody for an improper purpose like to gain voters so um hello okay we saw something like that with Bonnie Willis the underlying implication was that she generated this Trump prosecution so she could get her man paid, you know? So that the implication of that can be unseemly and problematic. So anyway, so yeah, Carmack, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let Carmack, your man worry about his own payments. <laughs> right. And he wasn't even that good anyway. All that drama for <laughs> nothing. I watched him in court. He was not great. Carmack Alves dismissed the firearm enhancement and re resigned. Okay. Publicly, however, the state disparaged Baldwin and his counsel to divert attention from their misconduct and elementary legal mistakes. Calling Baldwin's counsel fancy big city lawyers who cared about nothing more than billable hours, you should not disparage opposing counsel. That is unethical. You shouldn't do that. The world was appalled. Commentators noted the prosecutor's unethical behavior and constitutional violations. 
And prominent judges, attorneys, and scholars in uniformly criticized the merits of the state's case against Baldwin. Well, this is very unfortunate because I think the case in and of itself without all the extra hoopla has merit to it, but that's just me. I think they may have a hard time uh, convincing a jury at this point, but um, mm. I am skeptical. I mean, I I think realistically Baldwin should be convicted. I think mm -hmm. practically speaking, I don't think he will be. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my bet. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I could see that. I could see that there's been a lot of mucking up of things. I still hold on to the thought that if Alec Baldwin were only an actor in this film, I would think they would have zero chance of convicting him because their expert, the state's expert, testified at Gutierrez Reed's uh, case that it's not common for actors to check and see you know, what is inside the gun before firing it. They just hand it off to the armorer. The armorer does it and hands it back or whatever the case may be. But here he was a producer. And, and again, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I, I don't know. But I'm just saying, legally speaking, if the practice of the entire industry is not to do something and he doesn't deviate from the practice, I think it would be hard to find that level of criminal culpability. But he is not only an actor here, he is a producer. And so I do think he has some type of responsibility for hiring Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Um, and yeah, although I don't think they're going to be able to get any sort of conviction for the hiring aspect, because no. mm -hmm. otherwise, I mean, there's a lot of people and it's not even clear how much of an actual role he had in that sense, because it's not um, producer in Hollywood doesn't necessarily mean much. Um, mm -hmm. It can mean that you had a whole big role, but often it just means you, you know, you got a title on something because, uh, you know because you're it <laughs> you got money <laughs> you're a big shot i don't know um, yeah because you're a big shot is a good way to put it because right. you know it's like um they often give out like producer credits just fairly mm -hmm. readily mm -hmm. and so at that point it's like well was he really did he have any really significant role or was he just um kind of also there right that wasn't borne out in the trial because the focus was on Gutierrez Reed. And I was hoping to see whether or not, not hoping to see, but I was interested to see whether or not that particular prong would be fleshed out. I was, there was a something I was on and the attorney for Miss Hall, for Mr. Halls uh, was the one that took the plea agreement before Gutierrez Reed's trial. And uh, she was basically saying that uh, Baldwin did not have any supervisory authority and did not hire Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And like, I, she was speaking as someone that was in the know because she represents one of the parties. And so yeah. I was like, okay, well, that would be interesting to see because if he didn't in real life participate in her hiring, then how much could you hold him to? But I, I just don't know if that's been borne out yet. So, so say if there was a hypothetical universe in which he did have some type of authority or involvement in the hiring of certain individuals and chose this person who was like a nepotism hire, basically, um, who was not, I, I don't think, ready for prime time. She wasn't ready for this uh, job, right? No, and, she was absolutely not. I mean, right. Um, I think yeah. basically the problem is that Thel Reed wasn't able to keep doing the job mm -hmm. and she wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I think some people took advantage of that for their own reasons mm -hmm. and that puts her into a role. She was not, not at all like, yeah. And I mean, you know, some people have said like, you know, Oh, well, you know, uh, some people have made it into a very gendered thing. And I'm like, it isn't that it's that she herself as a specific individual mm -hmm. uh, really didn't seem to have the maturity necessary for this. Right. And, um, yeah, I didn't see this as a gendered issue at all, you know, and I and I do look out for intersectionality where those things are relevant. But I, I think that this had more to do with nepotism than anything, which could be a male or female child. But I just people assume that because your parent was really good at something that you are like naturally an armorer. That's not how that works, you know? So. <laughs> well, that's... and Bowles tried to suggest that there was like no way that she could stand up to, uh, you know, to these big names because she's just a young woman. And I'm like, 
Mm, no, but also if you can't, don't take a job where that's the key element. Right. Is is to so. say no, say no, which is what the uh, the expert, I keep think, forgetting his name, but I, I really liked his testimony a lot, but it was the expert for the state side that talked. He was a younger guy with dark hair. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? It was the expert for the state on um, guns on set, you know. I can't think of what his name was, but I think he said some things that were ultimately... Um, Carpenter? Carpenter. Carpenter, yes. Yeah. That he were gets mentioned in this as well. Okay, I uh, think he said things that were ultimately helpful to Baldwin when if you limit it down to he's only an actor, right? And again, I think the trial would play that out. If you limit it down to that, then actors don't normally do X, Y, Z. I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think that's smart. I think that they should improve their standards. But if every single actor in Hollywood does not check to see whether or not it's a dummy round or a blank or a live round, then I don't know how you could hold him responsible. But again, I think it comes back to what is his role if it's more than just an actor. But that's, we're going in circles. Let me just keep and going. And one of the complaints yeah. that we'll see is, um, is they're going to say that uh, Mr. Carpenter said certain things at the, uh, the grand jury mm -hmm. that were different than what he said at Hannah's trial. So they're, mm -hmm. uh, they've got some, uh, some issues on that. So. Yeah, I don't know if that if okay, that's interesting, but I think that's impeachment for trial. That doesn't mean that your indictment gets dismissed, you know, because like that's not something the state is like the state is not there's no evidence that the state in that moment at the indictment or the grand jury is purposefully eliciting false testimony. If a witness changes their story on the stand, that doesn't necessarily mean an indictment goes away, in my opinion. But there's yeah. other things here that do concern me. Okay. All right. So a few weeks later, Morrissey served a target notice on Baldwin from which she removed the 48 hour deadline for the submission of Baldwin's grand jury alert letter to shorten Baldwin's time to prepare the letter. Morrissey admitted to Baldwin's counsel that she had never seen this deadline removed, but then stated illogically that she just wanted to ensure that Baldwin was being treated like everyone else. In fact, Morrissey had served a target notice on Hannah Gutierrez-Reed the same day that included the 48-hour deadline that Morrissey removed from Baldwin's notice. See, any time in the law that you can show in, to a court disparity in treatment between different parties, courts don't like that, right? Morrissey, just, but yeah, the thing I wonder here is like removing the 48-hour deadline, that doesn't shorten it. It seems to lengthen it. Um, because then they they say that uh, Morrissey applied to the court to shorten it, but it's like, okay, but the the court can shorten it, sure, mm -hmm. but removing that language doesn't necessarily like that doesn't do what they seem to say it does, or at least doesn't feel like it. So mm -hmm. maybe I don't understand. <laughs> I don't know either, but I'm looking back at the statute. I was trying to see if there was a um a grand jury blah, 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 blah. the writing shells okay what they okay 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 um a prosecuting attorney shall use a reasonable diligence to notify a person in writing that they are a target the target and the target's attorney shall be notified in later in writing no later than four business days before the scheduled grand jury proceeding if the target is incarcerated and they shall be notified in writing no later than 10 business days before the scheduled proceeding if the target is not um, incarcerated. It doesn't have a 48 hour deadline in the statute itself. So removing that 48 hour deadline, I don't think I don't really see the prejudice in that unless it's like you know, this grand jury is about to uh, convene and you don't know when it's convening. I don't I don't know. But yeah, I'm not I'm not seeing the prejudice either, Ian. Okay. So keeping it going. Uh... Okay, the court denied the state's frivolous request and removed the grand jury date from November and moved the grand jury date from 2023 to January 2024. It also expressed concern that the grand jury date and facts about the grand jury process have been disclosed to the New York Times, for which the state was solely responsible. The court noted that the, pre the prejudice 
the prejudicial nature of these disclosures. Basically, you're trying to taint the jury pool, right? In this very case, the court explained a member of the sitting grand jury had asked the court if he could sit on the grand jury that would hear Baldwin's case. Oh, that's not good. The court therefore ordered the parties to refrain from disclosing anything about the grand jury process to the press while the process was ongoing. Within one hour, however, Morrissey violated the court's order by disclosing the content of that hearing to the press. Whoa! Including the new grand jury date, even after the court admonished her about the serious prejudice that could arise out of precisely that disclosure. Baldwin, therefore, filed sanctions and contempt motion, which prompted Morrissey to violate the court's order a second time because she also <laughs> disclosed the contents of that motion to the press. Miss Morrissey, what is your problem? <laughs> it's like, this isn't a court suggestion. It's a court mm -hmm. order. It's a court order. You know, this might lead to the indictment being dismissed just off of like the fla uh, flagrant, flagrant violations of the court's order. I mean, well, judges don't tend to like if you don't do what they say. They don't. <laughs> and this is just like, this is the tenor of what I don't like about this case, or what I've never liked about it, especially as it pertains to Baldwin. What happened here was horrendous. A woman, a mother, a wife lost her life, lost her life just doing her job. She wasn't hurting anybody. She wasn't doing anything wrong. She was just doing her job and she gets killed on the set of this movie, right? It's supposed to be fantasy and make believe and she gets killed in real life. And that should be taken seriously. But, but making all these announcements to the press after the court told you not to do that, going to these um, committee meetings and saying we need more money so that we can prosecute um, Baldwin and then dropping the case against him. All of those things really creep me out. I don't like that. You know, this case should be taken very, very seriously because it's serious. Someone died, you know. Ugh. Oh, my goodness. So the state also refused to read Baldwin's proposed charging instructions to the grand jury, noting that it would read a different instruction about. Um, intervening cause, even though the state's preferred instruction stated that it did not apply in homicide cases and would not read an instruction about involuntary manslaughter that deviated from the uniform jury instructions. The state therefore filed a motion seeking permission to disregard Baldwin's alert letter. The court denied the state's motion with respect to the evidence. The court ordered the state to make nearly all favorable evidence and witnesses available to the grand jury. As for the jury instructions, the court ordered that the state ordered the state to provide Baldwin requested instructions on the issue of intervening cause if the evidence supported it. And the court ruled that the state's instruction about involuntary manslaughter must precise, precisely track the uniform jury instructions. The court's ruling came just days before the grand jury presentation was set to start, which, given the grand jury schedule, left only two days for the state to present the entire case before the grand jury's term expired. So grand juries are convened for limited terms. Um, and, uh, every state, every County, every place does it differently and has different rules on it, but there's not always just a grand jury in the courthouse ready to go. So that's what they're talking about. Baldwin warned the state in writing that it would not have enough time to present the evidence from his alert letter before the term ended. And he asked the state to adjourn the grand jury date to ensure his evidence could be presented. But the state ignored Baldwin's letter and jammed through its presentation in barely more than one day. The state did so by violating nearly every rule in the book. <laughs> okay, it's very colloquial. <laughs> it did not explain the meaning or purpose of Baldwin's alert letter to the grand jury. It did not tell the grand jurors that they had the right and, in fact, the obligation to request and hear all exculpatory evidence. See NMSA 1978, Section 31-6-11B. It is the duty of the grand jury to weigh all the evidence submitted to it when it has reason to believe that other lawful, competent, and relevant evidence is available that would disprove or reduce a charge or accusation or that would make an indictment unjustified. Then it shall order the evidence produced. The state did not make Baldwin's witnesses available to testify, nor did it present the nor did it present the exculpatory and favorable evidence to the grand jury. When grand jurors asked questions about exculpatory witnesses or facts, the state instead forced them to hear answers from the state's chosen and usually paid witnesses. I'm assuming that's police, even when those witnesses had no personal knowledge or foundation. Experts. Oh, experts. Oh, uh, when the, uh, even when those witnesses had no personal knowledge or foundation for giving testimony about the subject. And on top of it all, 
the state read the grand jury an involuntary manslaughter instruction that violated the court's order, unfairly stacked the deck against Baldwin, and contained language that was inconsistent with both the UJI and the state's own opposition to Baldwin's request for a different instruction. Ian, your thoughts so far? I mean, the exculpatory and favorable evidence aspect seems to be in contravention of that, but they're going to get really nitpicky about it. Like, Hey, mm. which witnesses did you call? Did you explain enough? I don't know. A lot of this, I'm like, is there a duty to explain the letter to the grand jury? Or is there a duty to present the letter to the grand jury? Right. Like, I don't know. Cause those are different things. That's right. So, and there's a lot of things in this that make me wonder if this wasn't intended for the media instead of for the court. Right. Um, like when they go through every grievance they have with the, uh, you know, with the prior uh, prosecutors, uh -huh. I'm like, is that really relevant to this right now? I was just about to say, okay, so there's, I, I'm in my mind, I'm kind of like bifurcating this, right? I want to see the state's response so that I can know I can I want to see them say, like, actually, you know, we don't have an obligation to have your witnesses answer their questions. Their questions were answered. Right. And yeah. we didn't present what you you said to present or we did present what you said to present and you mischaracterized what it is that we actually presented or something like that. But all of the stuff about the former prosecutors that were on the case was griping all of it was griping and it's not yeah. griping for the court because the court knows that those orders were violated. That's that took place already. So that doesn't have anything to do really with this, you know, indictment. So I, I agree with that um, real quick. Ian, let me just do something real annoying. Hold tight. <laughs> Welcome to all 1,000 of you. <laughs> Please make sure that you hit the like button. <laughs> Let's keep this going. Okay. The state prosecutors have engaged in this misconduct and publicly dragged Baldwin through the cesspool created by their improprieties without any regard for the fact that serious criminal charges have been hanging over his head for two and a half years. They don't care about that. Enough is enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay guys enough is enough guys too much <laughs> it's tough it's hard <laughs> this is an abuse of the system and an abuse of an innocent person whose rights have been trampled to the extreme the court should dismiss this indictment see Herrera v Sanchez 2014 New Mexico Supreme Court 018 I'm looking that case up can you take this over while I look up the case is that okay uh yep um, uh, so dismissing the indictment where the state conducted the grand jury proceedings in a manner that violated grand jury statutes designed to protect the structural integrity of our grand jury system, rendering the process proceedings fundamentally unfair and warranting a presumption of prejudice to the petitioner. So factual background, initial prosecution and its dismissal. So they're going to take us back to the beginning of time here. Um, on October 21st, 2021, a tragic accident took place at Bonanza Creek Ranch, 20 miles outside of Santa Fe, on the set of the film Rust. While the cast and crew were re rehearsing a scene, a prop gun was put in Alec Baldwin's hand. I'm sure he was just standing there and somebody like, oh. here you go. Where'd this come from? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> According to most witnesses, the person who gave it to him shouted cold gun to signify that it was loaded with inert dummy rounds and therefore safe to handle. Helena Hutchins, the film cinematographer, directed Baldwin to draw the gun from its holster and aim it toward the camera. Hutchins, like Baldwin, clearly believed that the gun was cold. Had there been any doubts between them, she would not have instructed him to point the gun in her direction and he would not have done so. But both Hutchins and Baldwin were wrong. The gun was not cold. Unfathomably, it contained a live round, which discharged and struck Hutchins, killing her. Baldwin fully cooperated with the state's investigation from the beginning. On the day of the accident, he voluntarily sat for an hour-long interview at the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office without the presence of counsel and told the investigators he would remain on hand for as long as he was needed. 
He allowed his entire cell phone to be imaged by law enforcement. At no point did he believe that he was the target of a criminal investigation. And he was told by the state that if he ever did become a target, uh, that uh, he would be informed well in advance of any decision to charge him. The state did not keep its word. Instead, in January 2023, the state blindsided Baldwin with felony charges, which he first learned about from a Wall Street Journal reporter 40 minutes before they were publicly announced, and then orchestrated a vicious media campaign that annihilated any chance of a fair prosecution. Um, note, they've already lost that, that application. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, led by district attorney, Mary Carl Carmack Altwies and special prosecutor, Andrea Reeb, the prosecution violated Baldwin's constitutional rights and committed numerous procedural and ethical violations that undermined the prosecution's credibility and exposed the frailty of its case. They violated the ex post facto clauses of the United States and New Mexico constitutions by charging Baldwin with a firearm enhancement that hadn't been enacted when the accident occurred. They violated the ethical rules governing prosecutors by disparaging Baldwin in the press and commenting on his purported guilt. Reeb wrote to Carmack Altwies that announcing her role in Baldwin's prosecution would help her election campaign for the state legislature. Within two months of announcing the charges against Baldwin, Carmack Altwies and Reeb were forced to resign. Okay, and none so, of this matters I was just, to now. Exactly. <laughs> none of this is relevant to this motion. There's a whole... It's just like, I, and unless they're trying to say that there is a pattern of unfair prosecution that has fatally impacted this case so that it cannot go forward. But that's not really what this motion is about. This motion is saying that this indictment done by different prosecutors was, you know, done incorrectly, basically. Okay. Yeah. I pulled the case up. Uh, let me show it to you guys real quick. Um, there's uh, not the whole case, but just uh, what the opinion is about. And this is an indictment being dismissed. Okay. So after her indictment for second degree murder, which I think is kind of uh, similar to what we're, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> after her indictment for second degree murder, but prior to trial, petitioner Amy Herrera sought a writ of mandamus from this court, directing the district court to dismiss the indictment. Petitioner contends that the prosecuting attorney assisting the grand jury failed to adhere to certain structural protections of our grand jury statutes that are critical to the integrity of our grand jury system. And I'm so jealous. I want those protections. <laughs> the civil petitioner argues that the prosecutor prevented the grand jury from inquiring into the facts, demonstrating probable cause, and failed to act in a fair and impartial manner when instructing the grand jury. We agree that the manner in which the prosecutor conducted the grand jury proceedings warrants dismissal of the indictment. We therefore issued a writ of mandamus directing the district court to dismiss the indictment without prejudice. That meant that in that case, the state could bring it back. But it seems like here they can't because they've already brought an indictment before. Right. Um, we'll have to see. I mean, mm -hmm. if they dismiss it without prejudice, then it might be that they do this all over again. Right. But can case, they uh, dismiss it without prejudice? I guess is my question. Is that a possibility? I'm, I'm not, clear. not certain. Yeah. Okay. Um, someone said that Emily D. Baker said that this would be their last chance at it. So I, I don't know, but I would yeah. like to see some law on that, you know? Yeah. And I'm in the same boat. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I think we're all sort of uh, trying to guess. <laughs> yeah. Trying to guess. And it's also because um, this, this New Mexico statute um, and uh, grand jury scheme is the word I'm coming up with, but that's not what I really mean. Like this format of doing a grand jury is so foreign to me. It's so alien. And I think it's alien to a lot of attorneys in a lot of other different states. So I'm not sure what the remedy would be, but I'm sure that Emily would have done her research. And I just want to see the research that she did so I can also know for myself. Um, okay. So let me just uh, go back to this oh my computer just switched to dark mode and i don't know where anything is okay so <laughs> <laughs> six months after dismissing all charges against baldwin the state pursues an indictment on october 5th 2023 morrissey informed baldwin that she would present the case 
to oh in march 2023 the state appointed special prosecutor carrie morrissey and jason lewis one month later after a presentation by baldwin's counsel the state dismissed the case Morrissey informed Baldwin that she would present the case to a grand jury. That same day, the New York Times published an article revealing that Morrissey had conducted an interview with the Times about the case in which she improperly disclosed details about her intention to present the case to a grand jury. You're not supposed to be disclosing stuff that's happening with grand jury. It's supposed to be secret. Yet another disclosure that violated basic rules governing grand jury secrecy. Absolutely. The article explains the prosecution's view... That evidence about the gun contradicted Mr. Baldwin's assertion that he had not pulled the trigger. I don't know why he keeps saying that. That's one thing that bothers me about this case with Baldwin, Ian, is the insistence that he didn't pull the trigger. I just don't see how that's possible. Do, can I, you give me some insight on that? I bought the same gun that he used on the set. Okay. And I can tell you, he said that he was wow. practicing fanning. Mm -hmm. And fanning is a technique because these uh, these are single action revolvers, right? So mm -hmm. um, and what single action means is that pulling the trigger does one thing. It drops the hammer. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are familiar with double action firearms where when you pull the trigger, it pulls the hammer back and then fires. OK, so if you don't manually pull the, the hammer back, it doesn't do anything. But fanning was a way to sort of get um, to fire faster. Mm -hmm. And the way that works is you hold the trigger down and then you repeatedly work the hammer. And because the trigger is being held down, as you pull the hammer back and you just let it drop and the gun will fire. Oh. So he said he was practicing fanning. You can't fan it unless your finger's on the trigger. And the other oh. thing is that 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 has a very, um, very light trigger. So it's very easy to just rest your finger on the trigger and not realize that you're pulling it, especially when you pull the uh, the hammer back. Mm -hmm. It's very. Um, so I, I think his finger was on the trigger like that's right. what I think happened. And I don't see any other way that shakes out. So. I mean, not just uh, was it, uh, but it pulled the trigger, right? Like not just on the trigger, like resting on it. It would have had to pull the trigger, no? Or is that? Well, the thing is, is that, that if your finger is resting on the trigger, you're almost certainly going to pull it when you m try to move the uh, oh. the hammer back, just because uh -huh. mechanics. Your, your fingers are all connected, right? Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that it's really easy. To if you grab the gun when the trigger is when the hammer's back, to rest your finger on the trigger and not realize that you're pulling it, mm -hmm. because it won't do anything if you pull the trigger at that point, mm -hmm. and the amount of force necessary to pull that trigger is incredibly light. Um, I actually just got a um, um, let's see where did I put it? Where did I put it? Okay, I just bought a uh, a machine for measuring trigger pulls. Okay. And I set it down here somewhere. Um, While you're looking for that, um, I'm just talking to my editor. Devin, um, can we uh, pull a short for that explanation that Ian just gave? And then when Ian earlier gave an explanation about the difference between dummy rounds, blanks, and live rounds, because I think that that's very helpful to the audience. Um, yeah, I feel so like go I'm ahead. the only yeah. person who doesn't have an editor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, editor I, I, I gave up on editing. I can't do it anymore. It just I, I don't know if it's like a lack of attention or something. So thank goodness, if you ever do want to use her, her name is um, Devin and her company is Divine Designs. She's great. Oh. So I don't, I doubt this thing's got battery, but it's um, okay. like a trigger gauge. Okay. If it does, I may step aside and just be like, Hey, um, I'm going to go measure the trigger pull on mine. Cause, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, um, uh, <laughs> it got a little arm for it. Yeah. Um, but, uh, eh, where does it, uh, it looks like it's got a battery connector that I got to. But yeah, I bought this thing specifically so that I could check the trigger pull now. Okay. Um, because I think it's um, I think it's very um, 
it's a very light trigger pull. I think they said it was something like two and a half pounds in the oh. trial. Okay. And two and a half pounds is like nothing. Okay. Um, so two and a half pounds is basically, um, you know, is basically it's ridiculously light. So okay. Uh, so when you when you say that, and my and I turn my defense attorney brain on. That leads me to think if we credit his statement that he didn't think he pulled the trigger because the trigger right. is so light. He didn't, he really like in his heart, I, I didn't pull the trigger. I didn't, it, it's so, but it's just lighter than like, I guess the one time I pulled a gun, it did not, I, I, I went to the gun range a few years ago for my birthday. That's the only time I ever touched a gun. That trigger was not light. Okay. And I was terrified. <laughs> it was and, not light. <laughs> and the thing is, is that a lot of those gun range, like the rental guns, mm -hmm. um, they'll typically have a trigger that is um, substantially heavier than you might like. Mm -hmm. um, because, and if I was like, if I was setting this gun for a, um, you know, um, for that, I would be like, okay, you know what? We're going to, we're going to specifically put this as a, uh, we're going to turn it, tune it up. Mm -hmm. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think you'd want to trigger this light, you know, generally for the, but this, the reason why it's fine in this is that it's a double action firearm, mm -hmm. but, or sorry, single action firearm. But I, my suspicion is that he put his finger on the trigger, had the, you know, had it pulled down, didn't realize he had it pulled down. And cause the trigger is, is very light and then just pulled the hammer back and then mm -hmm. it went bang. Um, Ian, your camera just went out of focus for some reason. Yeah, it does that. Um, oh, but I've got to fix you, it. Yeah. All of a sudden you look like you're on a potato or something. <laughs> the, um, this webcam for some reason decides it's going to auto zoom. Yeah. And it's notion of what auto zoom, uh, um it's like zooming in on your chair and not on you or something like that like it's yeah i just on gotta uh, on the side yeah yeah i gotta and I mean, pull up the if, properties thing here <laughs> if my live stream ever goes over two hours my camera starts going ah! <laughs> it starts like freaking out so trust me i know the struggle okay well let me pick there this up and keep reading it okay let me keep this going so the state attempts to to rig the process ahead of the grand jury. Special prosecutors filed two unprecedented motions, one to limit Baldwin's time to submit an alert letter and the other to seek permission to voir dire the grand jury. On October 25th, 2023, a week after improperly announcing the grand jury date to the public, Morrissey and Lewis serve a target notice on Baldwin that omitted the standard 48 hour deadline for the target to provide a grand jury alert letter, even though they simultaneously acknowledge never having seen that provision omitted before every target this is an email every target notice i have ever sent in new seen in new mexico has a sentence that indicates that the target must notify the prosecution of potential witnesses questions or exhibits 48 hours prior to the grand jury date i just feel like by removing that notice now you no longer are limited by the 48 hours but okay after admitting that she had eliminated the standard provision from the target letter morrissey stated that she was nonetheless happy to work with baldwin's counsel in regard and will fully um, in this regard, and will fully consider any requests made by Baldwin's counsel. Further, although Morrissey said she intended to ask the grand jury judge to shorten the deadline for Baldwin to submit an alert letter from November 14th to November 10th, just a few weeks after Baldwin received the target notice, Morrissey also asked whether that was agreeable and to let me know your thoughts. Baldwin responded that at a minimum, he should receive the full time to submit an alert letter that he is entitled to under New Mexico law, especially given the volume of evidence and number of witnesses involved in this case. In addition, Baldwin stated that the grand jury date should be adjourned to allow the state sufficient time to review the voluminous alert letter we will be submitting and to ensure this process is done properly the first time around. Baldwin believed this to be a reasonable and fair approach because the prosecuting attorney is required to alert the grand jury to all lawful, competent, and relevant evidence that disproves or reduces a charge or accusation or that makes an indictment unjustifiable and that is within the knowledge, possession, or control of the prosecuting attorney. There is a significant volume of evidence in this case, and the consequences of any failure to present exculpatory evidence are severe. 
Baldwin therefore asked Morrissey if she was willing to discuss a reasonable schedule for this process. Although Morrissey expressed a willingness to work with Baldwin's counsel in this regard and discuss a schedule that was agreeable to Baldwin, Morrissey immediately rejected Baldwin's request and stated that Baldwin was not entitled to additional time to submit requests that certain evidence witnesses be presented uh, to the grand jury. Morrissey also claimed that the state intended to treat Mr. Baldwin not differently than similarly situated defendants in New Mexico, even though she had just admitted that she'd never seen a target treated that way. In fact, the special prosecutors already had treated Baldwin differently. On the same day they served the target notice on Baldwin, they also served a target notice on Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. But that target notice Morrissey served on Gutierrez-Reed contained the 48-hour deadline that Morrissey had intentionally deleted from Baldwin's letter, which therefore gave Gutierrez Reed four days more than Baldwin to submit exculpatory material. I see why they're interpreting it that way now. Okay. So on October 30th, 2023, the state filed an expedited motion to shorten Baldwin's time to present exculpatory evidence by four days. In its motion, the state falsely represented that it had provided Baldwin continuous access to its investigative files since April 2023 when the previous prosecution was dismissed and argued that, in any event, Baldwin didn't need the full statutory period to provide exculpatory evidence because he was already well aware of all possible directly exculpatory evidence today. That's bullshit. Beyond that, the state expressed concern that Baldwin would intentionally withhold the requested exculpatory evidence until exactly 48 hours prior to the grand jury to cause the postponement of the grand jury proceeding. As Baldwin explained, the state's position was backwards. Baldwin was entitled to submit a letter, an alert letter, up to 48 hours before the grand jury proceeding, and all the state had to do to alleviate its self-imposed time crunch was adjourn its unreasonably accelerated schedule for the grand jury process. Further, as Baldwin explained, the state's argument made no sense. The purported fact that Baldwin had access to a massive number of files would support giving him more time to review the documents and draft an alert letter, not less. The only plausible inference to be drawn from the state's approach and the fact that Gutierrez Reed was being afforded the rights that Baldwin was being denied is that the state wanted to make it harder for Baldwin to alert the grand jury to relevant and exculpatory evidence. In parallel with this unprecedented effort to shorten Baldwin's time to submit an alert letter, the state also made an unprecedented request to conduct a one-sided voir dire of the grand jury. The, purpose, the purported reason for the state's request was to control the significant amount of information, some of it inaccurate or incomplete, being made available to prospective jurors through the media. What the state's motion failed to acknowledge, however, is that the media environment surrounding the incident, particularly the coverage most prejudicial to Baldwin, was primarily the result of the state's own unethical press campaign. On November 9, 2023, the court heard argument regarding the state's attempt to limit Baldwin's right to submit an alert letter up to 48 hours before the grand jury and the state's request to voir dire the grand jury. The court denied both motions, thereby ruling in favor of Baldwin. I'm going to take a pause here. Ian, do you have any thoughts on this section of the motion? I mean, they're like, okay, the state denied this. The state's allowed to bring applications. Right. And like bringing a whole bunch of noise about like they brought an application which was denied. Right. At this stage, I'm like, okay, cool. Um, mm -hmm. What you've, you've got to actually show that like they violated that, which they're going to show about some things, but not so much mm -hmm. on this. So following along with, with your reasoning, that raises the concern for me that we're now on page 11 and they have not explicitly said what they failed to show the grand jury in like they, they've alluded to it, but they haven't specifically gotten there on page 11. What did they yeah. fail to show the grand jury that you gave them? Because the judge ruled in your favor. And like you said, they're allowed to make motions, you know, please shorten the time, please do this. And the court says no. And then now after the court ruled, in what way did they violate the court's ruling? Right. And they're going to get there eventually, but it's going to take a while. Right. So, right. Yeah. OK, well, mm, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> so. One second. Hi, DJ. Hi, DJ. Ian, meet DJ. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So cute. Oh, oh hi, DJ. It's okay, DJ. DJ is my um, in-laws dog. 
And my brother-in-law came and brought DJ because DJ is going to be joining the family. And so my brother-in-law is here and there's a big party going on outside. There's a lot of noise and um, we're taking DJ and uh, giving him a new home um, because, you know, the, um, his family is retiring and traveling a lot. And so we're going to make sure DJ gets all the attention he needs. Um, okay. So, uh, on November 14th, 2023, 48 hours before the grand jury was scheduled to begin, Baldwin submitted an alert letter to the state that identified several key witnesses in dozens of documents that would disprove the charges against Baldwin or otherwise make an indictment unjustified. Specifically, the alert letter identified the following witnesses whose testimony would be exculpatory or favorable to Baldwin's case. I hope that you guys are okay with me um, just saying their names instead of going through all the details, but they would have called Joel Souza, Dave Halls, Sarah Zachary, Ryan Smith, Detective Alexandria Hancock, Detective Joel Kano, Robert Schilling. In addition to those witnesses, the alert letter identified 23 documents that Baldwin contended would disprove the charges against him or make an indictment unjustified. Baldwin's proposed documents included, among other things, a recording of the 911 call in which the caller who witnessed the gun go off describes it as an accident and places blame on someone other than Baldwin. Three search warrants containing numerous exculpatory statements from key witnesses, including a statement from a cameraman who witnessed the gun go off, that Baldwin had been very careful with the firearms on set. A statement that Halls told everyone, including Baldwin, that the gun was safe to handle before it went off. A statement from Halls that he should have checked all of the rounds of the gun, but didn't. And a statement from Gutierrez Reed that she didn't really check the gun too much before the incident. That really bothers me. I didn't really check the gun too much. And I'm not I'm not brushing over halls, right? Because there were so many failures in the system on the way to the shooting. But it's just so informal. I didn't really check the gun too much. You're the armorer. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> what why didn't you? Who's right? Who, whose job was it then? Right, right. A report from the New Mexico Occupational Health and Safety Bureau that demonstrates. Baldwin was not part of the rust management and that his authority on set was limited to creative decisions and, and excerpts from the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office report that contained further exculpatory statements from key witnesses. Text messages between Zachary Gutierrez Reed and Seth Kenny, the, the film's ammunition supplier, which contained evidence that Gutierrez Reed went target shooting with the driver of the prop truck before the incident and that unbeknownst to Baldwin, Gutierrez Reed consistently failed to follow proper safety protocols on the set of Rust and a previous film project. A letter signed by many of the cast and crew disputing that the set of Rust was inherently unsafe. A transcript from Dave Hall's proper interview in which he blames himself for the incident and states that no member of the cast or crew could have anticipated there would be live rounds on the, in the firearm on the set. The alert letter also requested that the state provide specific instructions to the grand jury on two critical elements of the charging statute. First, Baldwin requested an instruction that the criminal negligence standard requires the prosecution to show that Mr. Baldwin had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition. That is, that the gun was handling he was handling was likely loaded with live ammunition and therefore posed a substantial risk to human life and that he willfully disregarded that risk when pointing the gun towards Hutchins. Alec Baldwin's response to state's motion is what they're citing here. Second, Baldwin requested an instruction that proximate cause is an element of causation and that the element of proximate cause is negated where there is negligence of a third party. That's extremely important to his case. They're basically saying that the proximate cause of the you know, of the death was the intervening act of Hannah Gutierrez Reed uh, failing to do her job. Therefore, there's a live round inside the gun. That's that's an important element of his defense. <clears throat> um, the third party, someone other than Mr. Baldwin, was the only significant cause of death or constitutes an intervening cause that broke the foreseeable chain of events. On November 15th, 2023, the state filed an expedited motion to preclude nearly all of the documents and witnesses that Baldwin identified in his alert letter. 
The state also sought to preclude Baldwin's requested jury instruction regarding subjective knowledge, arguing that an instruction requiring that the target had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition is an unprecedented departure from the elements of proof the law requires the law and rules require one moment. I just want to kind of take a moment here because a, I, an analogy just popped into my head. <laughs> so when, when we talk about, you know, proximate cause and, um, you know, um, breaking the chain of events, I want to point you guys to the Derek Chauvin case. That was his defense in his, in his trial for the uh, kneeling on George, George Floyd and causing his death. An important part of his defense was that George Floyd's consumption of, uh, narcotics was his proximate cause of death. That even though Chauvin had kneeled on him because uh, Floyd was on narcotics, that broke the chain and that was the cause of his death and not the actual kneeling. Like, yes, maybe the kneeling could have, you know, caused it at some point, but because this man was on drugs, he was unable to live and that's why he died, right? So that's a good, that was not successful for him, but that was his defense or one of his defenses. And so that would be one of Baldwin's defenses is that, yes, I pulled the trigger, even though I don't think I pulled the trigger, but the actual cause is that someone put a live round in that gun, unbeknownst to me. Is that a fair assessment you would say, Ian, or would you uh, interpret it a different way? Yeah, I mean, there's causation has to have a certain, um, you know, connection to things. So, um, and I had somebody who's giving me a bit of grief saying, like, you know, proximate cause. Uh, one thing that wouldn't be sort of a break in that chain was um, uh, getting poor uh, medical attention, right? Oh, uh, yes, um, yes, yes. Good, good example. Mm -hmm. The poor medical attention is like, you still wouldn't, you still would have, like, you got to still understand that you can die when you get shot. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, them having to get medical attention in the first place is, is mm -hmm. your fault. Right. But, you know, as sort of an, uh, as sort of another example, like, let's say, you know, let's say me and some guy get into a fight and, you know, and then as a result of that fight, he decides he doesn't want to live in Edmonton anymore. He, mm -hmm. he loses so badly, he decides he's going to move to Spain. Oh, he really got he, beat up then. <laughs> he drives to an airport, gets on a plane to Spain, and the uh, the plane crashes in the ocean. I'm not going to be held responsible for him dying at that point because right. there's like that's an intervening cause. The plane crash would have killed somebody in any event. Right. You know, so... You know, or similarly, like if I get into a fist fight with some guy and somebody decides that they want to help out and unbeknownst to me, like, I don't know this guy. The other guy doesn't know this guy. Somebody just pulls a gun and shoots him like the mm -hmm. person I'm fighting with and mm -hmm. is like, hey, Runkle, I got your back. It's like. I was not expecting this. <laughs> that's that's on him. Right. Mm -hmm. That's on that other guy. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, ma'am. No, sir. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Is your dog causing some trouble? Yeah, no, he's not causing trouble. He just stole something he shouldn't have taken just now, but it's it's his now. I'm not taking it out of his mouth. Okay. All right. Um, where was oh, and he's chowing down too. It was a French fry. I had a bolt. My husband brought me some French fries, and uh Ooh, DJ just need, got one. Yeah. I need some it of was, those. <laughs> yeah, they're really good too. <laughs> And just so you guys know, his name is DJ, and that is short for Dog Junior. <laughs> <laughs> his name is Dog Junior. He's so cute. I, I saw him at um, my in-law's house in California over the Christmas break, and I was like, I'm taking that dog, just so you know. <laughs> so it's been since California, I mean, since December that I've been saying I wanted him, and the other family was so sweet that they facilitated me, me getting him from them. Um <laughs> Okay, so the state further argued that such an instruction improperly, oh, I missed something. Okay, on November 15, 2023, the state filed an expedited motion to preclude nearly all of the documents and witnesses that Baldwin identified in his alert letter. The state also sought to preclude 
Baldwin's requested jury instruction regarding subjective knowledge, arguing that an instruction requiring that the target had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition is an unprecedented departure from the elements of proof the law requires. The state's motion to exclude the target's requested elements instruction as to the grand jury is what they're citing there. The state further argued that such instruction improperly assumes that the factual basis of negligent acts was failing to check the firearm for live rounds. And see, yeah, I, I don't think that that's the state's only theory. So let me get into that. According to the state, whether or not Baldwin had subjective knowledge of an actual risk that the firearm placed in his hand had been loaded with live ammunition has nothing to do with the other ways in which the state intends to show he negligently handled a firearm resulting in death. What are the other ways he negligently handled the firearm other than not checking? I, I'm kind of confused on that. Do you do you see what they're what they're saying there? I'm not quite getting what they're saying, what the state is saying. They refused to provide Baldwin's requested causation instruction. The state stated that it intended to provide a different instruction, even though in yet another legal blunder, the state preferred instruction stated that it didn't apply in homicide cases. On November 15, 2023, the court held a hearing to discuss the party's pending motions as well as the grand jury schedule. They stated that given the length and breadth of the state's, of the state's motion to preclude Baldwin's requested evidence, the court was vacating and rescheduling the grand jury from November 16, 2023 to January 18, 2024. The court also postponed argument on the state's motion to give the court time to review the party's submissions. The exact solution that Baldwin had originally proposed to the state to ensure the process is done properly the first time around. Okay. So you won that, okay? At the hearing, the court also expressed deep concern about the fact that the grand jury date and other information about the grand jury process had been disclosed to the media. Absolutely, not, not good. The court explained that disclosing the grand jury date to the press, which the state did, created the risk of prejudice and grand jurors had, in fact, approached the clerk seeking to serve on the grand jury. That means that these people heard in the news, they're about to indict um, Alec Baldwin and now they're seeking out, I want to be on this grand jury. That's not good. They're not supposed to come in there seeking out to be on the case because of what they heard in the media. The court, yeah, therefore, no. yeah. Just that, that is like, oh, that's a, that's a big problem. Yeah. I mean, certainly some issues for appeal here, I think. The court therefore unequivocally and repeatedly ordered the parties not to disclose the information about the grand jury process or what happened during the day's hearing. Dude, just lay down. He's just walking around, walking around. <laughs> the state's <laughs> violated. The state violated the court's order within one hour by disclosing details of the hearing to the press, including the new grand jury date, and the court had instructed the parties not to disclose. They did it anyway. Baldwin therefore filed a sanctions and contempt motion, smart, which prompted the state to violate the court's order again by making improper disclosures about those filings. As if things couldn't get worse in these discussions, the state also revealed its illicit motivations behind the prosecution. As reported in the article, prosecutors haven't said publicly what new evidence they had obtained during their months of investigation, but a source familiar with the case said that special prosecutors have had discussions in which they said they hope the trial will humble Baldwin, specifically citing his run-ins with paparazzi and public comments that weren't about the case. The source added that the intention is for it to be a teachable moment for Baldwin. Went, oh no now there are some issues here um ian because it's talking about the source so you can't directly attribute those statements to the prosecution but if those statements were actually made by the prosecution or statements to those effects that is completely inappropriate we do not prosecute people to humble them we prosecute people if you reasonably believe that they broke the law right mm. What do you think? Sometimes. I mean, sometimes the difference between getting prosecuted and not is indeed the attitude you take. And <sighs> dang. Yeah, go ahead. That's I that's mean, you're talking about that human nature element. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Keep prosecutors going. have a certain amount of discretion. And if somebody is sympathetic, then they may get a pass in a place where somebody else might not. So right. um yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, in practicals, in, in, the, in the world, that is true, right? Because there's prosecutorial discretion. Prosecutors are human beings, right? But they're not supposed to 
express that they're bringing an investigation for someone for commentary that they made, political commentary or whatever the case may be, personal commentary and the way they treat the, the paparazzi. They shouldn't be making those statements. Now, that's not to say that they actually made those statements. I keep saying to myself, a source, a source that doesn't mean that they actually said that, right? Like it could all be a bunch of BS. But yeah. my understanding of a prosecutor's ethical obligations, because I know that they differ from a defense attorney's ethical obligations, is that a prosecutor has a obligation to do justice. And so they have to do justice not only for the victims of crime, but also the alleged perpetrators of crime. And if they don't actually believe that there's probable cause, but they're only bringing it to teach a lesson, then that should be unethical because they shouldn't bring cases that they don't believe actually have probable cause. However, if they believe the case has probable cause, and in addition, they just don't like that guy, I don't think that that in and of itself is unethical. And that might be what's happening here. You know what I'm saying? Like, we really believe that there's a case here and we also don't like him. So let's go. You know, it could be that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. The following morning on the Today Show, the press added that the special prosecutor said they were also targeting Baldwin because they think he's arrogant. <laughs> Who is the press? <laughs> that was a stunning and extreme abuse of prosecutorial power. Consistent but with the that's, that's the press, though. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's my issue is who's really making these statements, right? Because that could just be that could just be like me and you sitting here and you're like, yeah, I mean, if you're a jerk, <laughs> you're more likely to get prosecuted. And then in a motion, Baldwin's lawyer saying, Runkle of the Bailey said that if you're a jerk, you're more likely to get prosecuted. And so they brought this case for an illegal purpose. You know what I mean? Versus and when, go ahead. The press makes stuff up all the time. All like, the time. Or they get things wrong all the time. Like, so I'm all just the like, time. I, yeah. Uh... Yeah. All the time. Right. Um, and, and I was going to say that, you know, following along with that, um, it is really, really easy to say that something, to say something is your opinion and then for someone else to mistake that for, there's a source for that opinion. You know what I mean? And so this is different from where earlier uh, there was like an email where the lady was like, oh yeah, make sure I get this case so I can get votes. And then she was kicked off the case, right? So yeah. <laughs> That's so an email I, from her, you know, right from her face. So Right. <laughs> so we know it's her, right? But here, I, I don't know that to be the case. I don't know it to be the case. But if it is the case, I think it's problematic um, if that's the sole reason for prosecution. But I don't think it is the sole reason for prosecution. Um, but we'll see. We'll see what they say. Yeah. Ooh, what did I do? Why is a spreadsheet coming up? <laughs> That is so funny. What did I just do? Okay. Let's get back to where I was because I don't know how to make this go away. All right, here we go. <laughs> okay. So this was a stunning and extreme abuse of prosecutorial power. Let me look at these um, thing. Chloe Mellis, previously unreleased video show Alec Baldwin firing prop gun with blanks and directing Russ crew on safety. C, Alec Baldwin fires prop gun in previously unreleased Russ video. Okay, but that's not direct quotes. Okay, the courts orders the state to make virtually all of Baldwin's exculpatory evidence available to the grand jury. This is what's really interesting to me because that, that's relevant to this grand jury and they're making a particular order. On January 11, 2024, the court overruled most of the state's objections to Baldwin's evidence and held that the grand jury must be told about nearly all of the evidence the state had sought to exclude. The January 11th order also rejected the state's narrow view of what it means to conduct a fair and impartial grand jury proceeding and provided the state with a roadmap to comply with its obligations. To begin with, the court explained that the state needed to facilitate the grand jury's inquiry into any lawful, relevant, and competent evidence not initially presented by the state and cannot unilaterally withhold evidence or witnesses requested by the grand jury. 
Special prosecutors were therefore obligated to alert the grand jury to any lawful, incompetent, and relevant evidence identified in Baldwin's alert letter that would disprove or reduce an accusation or make an indictment unjustified. Moreover, contrary to the state's inaccurate assertion that it was only required to present evidence that directly negates defendant's guilt, which adding to its mountains of legal errors, the state cited... <laughs> overruled law to support oh that's not good they, they cited law that's no longer law <laughs> law to support the court confirmed that baldwin's evidence need not be directly exculpatory to compel the state to alert the grand jury to its existence as the court noted the intent of section 31 dash 6 dash 11 b is to give the grand jury access to more evidence not less applying these principles the court ruled all seven of Baldwin's proposed witnesses must be made available to the grand jury, ordering the state to alert the grand jury to the existence of Baldwin's proposed witnesses and their potential testimony because the state failed to persuade the court that the potential testimony of Baldwin's proposed witnesses may not disprove or reduce a charge or accusation or may not make an indictment unjustified. As for the documentary evidence, the court ruled in favor of Baldwin with respect to 20 out of 21 documents that the state had sought to exclude. In a separate order issued the same day, the court cautioned the state that it must provide Baldwin's requested proximate cause instruction if the evidence supports its provision to the grand jury. Well, that's going to be within the state's assessment, whether or not it supports that, but okay. The court disagreed with Baldwin, however, that the state was required to instruct the grand jury that it was necessary to prove that Baldwin was subjectively aware that the gun he was handling was likely loaded with live ammunition. Accepting the state's argument that it was improper to require an instruction that is materially different from the relevant UJI instruction. And that's fair because Baldwin was complaining about them giving instru instruction that wasn't one of the pattern instructions, and then they were asking for a non-pattern instruction as well. So it should be fair yeah. across the board. Everyone should give, give pattern instructions. And uh, by pattern instructions, jury instructions can be anything as long as it's a correct statement of the law. And so you can request your own special jury instruction in any case, but there are almost, I think every state has a set of pattern jury instructions that usually has come up by the legislature or some other body that is put together to promulgate jury instructions. And the, as long as the law applies, those instructions are almost always given and then you can ask for special instructions. So that's what we're talking about here. Despite the court's order that the state had an obligation to act in a fair and impartial manner at all times during the grand jury proceeding, Morrissey and Lewis had a different agenda. As a starting point, the state <laughs> It's very dramatic. You know, Ian, I have to agree with you. It's very dramatic. <laughs> As a starting point, the state they're intended really spitting it hard. They are. Let me take a let me take a reading break right here. <laughs> it's just very, it's a lot. <laughs> and it's a lot of flourishy language. Okay, this is even, I told you I love prose. I love a well-written motion, but I need you to get to the point. Is this a well-written motion? No, I don't think so. There's just too much extraneous stuff that, you know, they're griping about things that the court has already addressed and remedies have already been granted for. So, yeah. you know, the whole let me prosecute Baldwin so I can get elected and then she gets kicked off. I don't feel like that influences this current prosecution. Yeah, it's like she was kicked off. So she's gone. What's the issue now? Right. This feels like it's a me like it's a reminder to the media. And it's not, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. And it's also kind of counteracting, and, and the state, in a way, brought it on themselves. It's counteracting all of the media stuff that the prosecution has been doing in this case that they should not have been doing. Um, particularly talking about, you know, guilt or innocence of Baldwin and stuff like that. Like, he's presenting his defense in this motion. The problem is, is that if the court feels that that's what he's doing then he's going to lose a lot of his ability to complain when the prosecution does it. That is a good point. Because mm -hmm. the prosecutor or the court can be like, well, you got yours. So, um, yeah, you've had your remedy on that. And yeah, move on. Yep. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Basically, they did it. Yep. You did it. Now it's over, right? Yep. You've had your yeah. remedy. Your remedy was to file that stuff and make all those noises. So right. off you go. Hmm. 
Specifically, Baldwin's counsel stated that based on the numerous questions you asked the court about the logistics of completing this process within only two days, we are concerned that you will be unable or unwilling to present all the information in the alert letter or may attempt to circumvent your obligations to do so. Baldwin, therefore, reiterated that the state required to present the alert letter. Oh, the state is required to present the alert letter in its entirety and to completely present any information the grand jury wishes to hear, regardless of when the grand jury's term expires, and that any effort to circumvent that obligation, including directly or implicitly encouraging the grand jury not to hear the information because it will prolong their terms of service, would violate New Mexico law. The letter requested that the state's presentation go before a new grand jury that has sufficient time to hear the necessary evidence and explicitly reserve Baldwin's right to seek to dismiss any charges that resulted from the state's failure to comply with the above obligations. The state ignored Baldwin's letter and conducted the grand jury proceeding in an expedited and unlawful manner. A, the state presents false and inaccurate testimony to the grand jury. Here we go. Page 26. Well, it's page 20 of the substantive motion, but page 26 of the entire document. We're finally to the meat and potatoes of the thing. <laughs> the um, yeah, we're <laughs> there's probably still more to go. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> OK. Yeah, this I'm, thing's a bit of a it's yeah. a bit of a marathon. OK, I'm putting on my news presenter voice. We're doing this thing. <laughs> the state presented seven witnesses to the grand jury. No, this is the product advisory voice for all the side effects of the medication. <laughs> <laughs> Three are on the district attorney's payroll. Two are from the Santa Fe Sheriff's Office, SFSO. One is suing Baldwin for money, and another began blaming Baldwin in the media within days of Hutchins' death, even though he quit the production before the accident and was not on set when it occurred. Of the state's seven witnesses, only one, Ross Adiego, and one suing Baldwin for money, witnessed the accident. Alexandria Hancock, the lead investigator on the case, and Marie Marissa Popple, a crime scene technician, were called to testify about the investigation. The SFSO mangled nearly every aspect of the investigation, but Morrissey did not elicit that relevant exculpatory evidence, nor did she elicit the exculpatory evidence and affidavits gathered through the investigation. Instead, she guided these in witnesses through tightly controlled and misleading questions that supported the state's narrative against Baldwin, even when that narrative contradicted the evidence. After Hancock and Popple, the state called Michael Hag one of the state's purported firearms experts, to testify that the firearm would not have fired on the day of the incident unless Baldwin pulled the trigger. Hogg, who had no personal knowledge of the testing, summarized the testing that had been conducted by the FBI, during which the firearm was beaten with a mallet and destroyed. I just want to say it's a grand jury. It doesn't matter if they had personal knowledge because the rules of evidence don't apply. Without preserving yeah. any evidence, of its condition when the accident occurred. Throughout his testimony, he referred to a video he prepared with the prosecution that depicted a different firearm from the one that was on set. Hogg omitted several essential facts regarding this testing, including that the FBI testing established that the gun did fire without a trigger pull when the firearm was fully loaded with six rounds as it was on the day of the incident. Notwithstanding this fact, of which both Hogg and the prosecution were aware, Hogg testified repeatedly that the firearm could not fire without a trigger pull. Further, Hogg admitted that the hammer of the firearm that fired the fatal uh, round was rounded, which would make it easier to fire. Without any support, however, Hogg testified that the hammer had been broken during FBI testing, an impossible conclusion to reach since the FBI did not inspect the parts of the firearm or preserve any evidence about the internal parts of the gun. No photographs, no videos, nothing. Before no, it conducted... When they say different gun, it's like mm -hmm. the same make and model. It's just, a, yeah... Like a demonstrative, basically. Yeah. Rather, as the state knew, the gun was new when Seth Kenny provided it to Rust, yet the internal components of the gun were inconsistent with stock parts, showed significant signs of aging, and showed clear signs of being modified and filed down. Images of the firearm after testing show filed down hammer notches that would have made it easier to fire without pulling the trigger, including most notably the full cock hammer notch at the bottom of the hammer that was completely filed off. Compare images of the hammer and other parts from the rust gun below and the same parts from an unaltered gun. Notice any obvious differences? Do you? I don't know. Image of the damaged internal parts of the rust gun from the FBI report. Do you see these parts here, Ian? I don't know. So, wait. They're going to show us a little diagram yeah. here on the next okay. page. Okay. Close-up image of rust gun showing field 
file down full cock notch and file down notches. I'm glad that these are pictures so I don't have to read a bunch of words. <laughs> Comparison of altered gun hammer far right with unaltered hammers three left showing diminished full half and quarter cock notches on the rust gun. None of this means anything to me. Just letting you know. I just deal with tool markings on projectiles. That's all I deal with. <laughs> Not <laughs> these parts of the gun. So, <laughs> But this is you know, probably just that the gun broke. Because that was, the yeah. Mm -hmm. The prosecution failed to explain that the elimination of these notches, which appear filed off and are inconsistent with being broken by the FBI's testing, would have made the gun significantly easier to fire and prone to malfunction. Moreover, the prosecution failed to explain that the hammer showed signs of rough tool marks, including file marks that are consistent with manipulation. The prosecution concealed this information from the grand jury and presented only hogs paid for unfounded speculation that one, the damage occurred during the FBI testing when the FBI made no such observation and neither hog nor anyone else inspected the gun before that testing and two the gun would have operated normally on set the prosecution also hid that hog was the state's paid witness so can you give me can you just give me some insights on that part just now that we went through because not my area of expertise so if you scroll back up to the picture there i will do that um the um this one or yeah uh, so the the one at the bottom there, you can see those um, that notch at the bottom, the one that's closest up to us. Um, okay, this one. You can see, yeah. Oh, I see you it. Can, mm -hmm. So that is intended to hold the uh, to hold the hammer back at the full cock position, mm -hmm. and um, that is sort of our. Uh, that's what they're saying is missing, but the thing is, is that the 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 government says that they broke that doing the testing because mm -hmm. they were spacking it with a mallet. So, yeah. Now, uh, some people in the chat are asking about the target shooting allegation. The government investigated that and they found no evidence that that ever happened. So that Hannah Gutierrez Reed was engaged in target shooting earlier yeah. that day or something like that yeah or at all on at the all. set of rust yeah okay so uh and i don't think that that explains things because um there was live ammo found in like six different places so yeah mm -hmm. okay Thank you so much. You, first of all i didn't even notice this difference so thank you for pointing that out to me and that so when the gun is cocked this holds the hammer back? Is that what you're saying? Same yeah. Thing? So, yeah. Okay. like, um, basically, internally, uh, each of these notches are something that basically the trigger mechanism will hold on to. Mm -hmm. So, as you, when you pull the hammer all the way back, mm -hmm. you can see this rotate, like this round bit sort mm -hmm. of angles back. Yeah. And then that notch is what has to get caught. And then when you pull oh. the trigger, a piece of metal moves, and then that could sort of spin freely, and mm -hmm. the hammer strikes the, uh, you know, hammer rotates, firing pin hits, uh, hits primer, bang happens, and you don't okay. want to be downrange of that. So, but there has to be a little notch there to catch that bit of metal. Okay. And so, if that is. The problem is, is that if it's filed down to the extent that they show there, mm -hmm. then it just wouldn't hold it. You wouldn't be able to actually put it back to uh, full cock in any event. Mm -hmm. So which the investigators who were looking at it were able to do. There might be situations where you might file things down in order to make it, um, you know, fire more easily. But mm -hmm. I don't think that like that doesn't seem like that actually happened. This is the, uh, the Baldwin team sort of making stuff out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Okay. So, so that, so you're saying that the fact that that is filed down to that extent, that that component is not, I don't think it's filed. I think it's broken. It's broken. And you think it broke after, is this the rust gun itself or the exemplar? The one at the bottom right is or the 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 close up there is yeah. the rust gun. 
Okay, the one that the okay, so this here is the rust gun. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's possible that it broke off after the shooting because were it to this extent, it would not have been able to cock in the first place. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. So it could this could not have been the condition of the gun at the time of the shooting or else the gun would not have been able to be cocked in the first place at that at that time. Yeah. OK, thank you for explaining that. And I hope that that was helpful to anyone else that needed that explanation and not tedious for those of you who did not. The prosecution failed to explain that the elimination of these notches would have made the gun significantly easier to fire and prone to malfunction. It doesn't sound like it would make it easier to fire, though. Moreover, the prosecution failed to explain that the hammer showed signs of rough tool marks, including file marks that are consistent with manipulation. OK, I read this part already. The state's next witness was Brian Carpenter, who, like Hogg, was paid by the state to testify. In media appearances, as well as on LinkedIn and the CVs he provided to the state last spring, Carpenter represents himself as an armorer and weapons expert. This guy's testimony I really liked. And you said that there are some differences between his testimony, and his grand jury testimony. So let's That's see. what they're saying. Yep. Yeah. But that is not how he represented himself to the grand jury. Instead, he introduced yeah. himself as the owner of a production studio that makes movies as if he started as an armorer, but has since taken on bigger roles in the industry. So what? That testimony was false yeah. and Morrissey knew it. Carpenter is not an experienced film producer. So... What is that relevant to? They're going to try to make it matter, but uh, it's such a quibble. I'm sorry. That's not relevant. I mean, yeah. Okay. So that's again, the, I feel like that would be an issue at trial. Like you misrepresented your extent of working as a producer. But if he started as an armorer, if he has experience as an armorer, if he works on film sets with guns and he has experience with that, what does it matter if he is not as much of a producer as he said he was in the grand jury? That's not relevant to the ultimate issue of the well, gun safety. And even the overblown is not that overblown when you get down to it. Mm -hmm. um, so. Hmm. Carpenter is not an experienced film producer. I, I don't see how that matters. Carpenter's studio, 13 South Productions, appears to have been involved in no more than one or two productions projects that were distributed to the public. The studio's IMDb page lists four productions, three of which appear to never have been released. Okay, so what? So he's worked on four productions and one of them has been released. Like, he says he's the owner of a production studio that makes movies. That is accurate. Right. right? He didn't say they made a lot of movies. And also... He testified about his experience as an armorer and dealing with guns on set. And that appears to be outside of his role in a production company. So, hmm, okay. This misrepresentation allowed Carter to testify well beyond his experience with credibility that he didn't earn. For example, Carpenter, you could have... Okay, let me shut up. Like, this is just them saying, like, we would have cross-examined on these points. And it's like... Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry okay, that cool. Gutierrez Reed's attorneys didn't do that. But that's not relevant, really. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, Gutierrez Reed's attorneys, let's be fair to them, sucked. So bad. Um, um, just... So bad. I feel bad for her because me she too. really deserved to actually have a defense Me and too. i mean to the ex i think bulls on balance may have overall helped the mm -hmm. government mm -hmm. and that to me is a problem <laughs> mm -hmm. like yeah that's that's not what i want out of my defense team if i'm you know charged with having killed somebody <laughs> So, so it, I mean, there was a lot of them like allowing the prosecutor to um, do a lot of leading questions in direct examination. They allowed a lot of stuff that I was just like, why are you allowing this? Like, what is like they were just like not objecting to anything for a certain period of time. It was very, and they very brought strange. they brought um, Hannah in for that second interview. Yes. Oh, that was your client had a right to remain silent. What is wrong with you? Well, and you know, in his arguments, he's saying like, 
Well, she gave this statement that was right after the shooting. And so she can't really, you know, she said some stupid things, but, you know, she was stressed and, you know, you just get things wrong. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, that would be an excellent argument, my dude, if you didn't bring her in for a second oh, interview yeah. where she confirmed all of the bad stuff and then some. Um, and you were sitting right next to her the whole time like a numpty. Oh yeah, I agree. Um, I'm really, I, con I'm concerned with this argument still Ian. go ahead. Let you finish your point and then I'll go get to my, I don't know if you've looked at their, um, their argument for a new trial. Um, Good it's so read. bad. Yeah, no, I haven't. I have not. She needs, it's to so get bad. she needs to get new lawyers. The problem is, is that these guys are doing it for free and I don't know that they're going to find somebody else that's within her price range. Oh. But she should really be rocking a public defender on this. No, um, oh wait, they're non-public defenders doing it for free, so they're just like pro bono counsel. Yep. No, yep. she should get a public defender. Yeah, she should and... get a public defender because they'll be way more experienced, and at least they'll freaking object during the trial. You know, I mean, I'm biased. And... I'm a public defender, so I'm biased. But she should. I think that we make great attorneys because we're always in court. So she should get a public defender. And the thing is, is like. Public defenders, like people give them a lot of grief, but public defenders actually put a ton of court time in and yeah. like they they put in a lot of work. They're they're good at what they do. And Bulls has not put in a good art, like good good showing here. No. So no, it really didn't. Um I, I'm still bothered by something about this section of this motion. And that is that if I remember Carpenter's testimony correctly, and it, you, some of you guys remember Carpenter's testimony directly, Carpenter testified mostly about his work as an armorer, not as yeah. a producer. That was what was most relevant. And he had been an armorer in like hundreds of movies, something like that, like a lot of movies. He was highly experienced as an armorer. And that's what he was. He was not there to testify as a producer. So I don't understand why they're like, well, he wasn't really as much of a producer as he says he was. And I just feel like that is I don't know. I just feel like that's a that's a straw man argument. And I don't like it. You know what I mean? Oh, it's um, it's more than a little sketch. Um, yeah. And. I you also see things like, um, what do you call it? The, uh, you know, they're, they're upset that he's talking about like the SAG, uh, bulletins. Mm -hmm. It's like, you don't think the armorers would pay attention to the SAG bulletins about of use of guns would. on a set. Of course like, they would. Of course it impacts they would. Them. It impacts them. Of course they probably and... inform it. They probably inform the bulletins, you know what I'm saying? Like their feedback. So, well, and here they also say like, and it's not true. This SAG bulletin, this SAG bulletin that he's talking about is one that came in after the, um, you know, after the shooting where they're trying to cover for Baldwin, but like the ones that were out there before mm -hmm. talked about how the actor is an important element in the safety chain. So ah, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, they basically, you know, they adjusted their, like what they stated because Baldwin was in trouble. Right. But before that, they, um, you know, they weren't so clear on that. Right. Um, so. I just want to take a second to thank Dr. Barry, who was in the comment section, as well as Uncivil Law, who I saw earlier. I'm not sure if he's still here. Uh, please subscribe to Dr. Patrice Barry. She has been a guest on the show. Hopefully we'll do another stream in the future, as well as to Kurt at Uncivil Law, who has also been a guest on this channel. And I've been a guest on his. Uh, please go and subscribe to their channels. They're awesome commentary commentators. Ian, if you've never interacted with uh, Dr. Barry, I highly recommend recommend you check her channel out she's a psychologist very very okay, intelligent cool. and has yeah and has great takes on a lot of the cases that we cover and from a different angle okay so let me just pick this back up um probably very relevant on a lot of these cases where uh, mental health starts to be yeah. uh, a consideration 
Yes. Unfortunately, the mentally ill are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and that's not a, a judgment. It just is, you know, an unfortunate it's thing. It's true. So it's just true. And no value judgment on that whatsoever. And so her insights on that are just so, so helpful. We covered a case about a, a woman who um, uh, killed her stepson and um, just took the, the country on this wild goose chase looking for this child, pretending that he had been kidnapped. And uh, Dr. Ooh. Barry and I covered it. It was really, really sad. She pretended that it was like a Latin. She's pretending with some Latino people that kidnapped the child. And then it turned out it was her that had killed the child all along. It's really, really sad. Um, the firearms bulletin makes clear that the actor has no obligation to check the gun. And as you said, Ian, this firearm bulletin came out after the shooting, right? Yeah. The, we the weapons handler, not the actor, is the one responsible for checking the gun before use, that the actor may point the gun. You know, the, the courts may disagree with you here. The actor may point the gun at the camera with the approval of the first assistant director, which Halls gave here, and that the armorer, Gutierrez Reed, and the first assistant director are exclusively responsible for firearm safety. I don't see that as exculpatory if it was not the, you know, the law or the regulation at the time it's not a law but you know their internal regulation I mean, if, at the time or it wasn't if clear. i'm the prosecution i'm definitely asking that uh i'm saying like uh this should be inadmissible it's they should right. only be able to rely on bulletins that came out before the right. the shooting not right. after because right. after might be changes in response or covering for baldwin Right. So I would certainly be saying that only bulletins that existed before the shooting mm. uh, should be relevant. Um, anything else is just, um, you know, anything else. If you want to bring something afterwards, call somebody from SAG. Right. I just had an epiphany, Ian. It's ironic because they rightfully complained that Baldwin was charged with a crime that wasn't a crime at the time that the shooting happened. Yeah. And now they're asking for the state to be beholden to a regulation that wasn't a regulation at the time that the shooting happened. So, you know, it's kind of going both sides here. Um, so, uh, and the armorer Gutierrez Reed and first assistant director are exclusively responsible for firearm safety. Um, if it is absolutely necessary to point a fire as, as someone, consult the property master or other safety representatives, such as the first AD stage manager, the property master, or his her in or in his or her absence, a weapons handler is responsible for ensuring the control and distribution of all firearms on the set, ensuring that any actor who is required to stand near the line of fire be allowed to witness the loading of the firearm. I still feel like. There has to be something in here if the, maybe the state is never able to really bear this out. But if it ever was supported by the evidence that in some type of role as a producer, he played some role in Gutierrez Reed being hired. I don't think this really matters, but maybe that's just not the facts of the case. We'll see. Carpenter falsely testifying that the SAG safety bulletin bars actors from pointing the weapon at anything you're not willing to destroy. Carpenter falsely asserting that the actor's fault for discharging that weapon because he's in charge of the firearm. That wasn't even really his testimony at the trial, so they could use that during their own trial. Morrissey elicited yeah. false testimony from Carpenter about these issues as well as others, despite knowing that it was false and without presenting the contrary exculpatory evidence. The next witness Morrissey called was Lane Looper, a member of the Russ camera crew who quit the production the day before the fatal accident. Despite Looper's absence from set on the day of the accident and his relatively narrow role as an assistant cameraman, Morrissey treated him as an expert on all things related to film safety. She even asked him to answer specific questions on firearm safety rules about which he had no expertise. Meanwhile, Looper's bias against Russ and his production arose before the accident even took place. He quit because the production would not pay for hotel rooms for crew members who live less than an hour away from the set. 
Within days of Hutchinson's death, Looper began airing his grievances in the media and publicly challenging Baldwin's version of events, which Looper was not even there to witness. At several points throughout this testimony, Looper made comments that were stricken as irrelevant and prejudicial, claiming that Baldwin was using my monitor as an ashtray for a cigar he was smoking. Yeah, that's not relevant to anything. Morrissey's presentation to the grand jury included just a single eyewitness to the event, a crew member named Ross Adiego. Neither Morrissey nor Adiego disclosed to the grand jury, however, that Adiego is suing Baldwin for money damages. That's exculpatory because that shows bias. The state's final witness, Connor Rice, is a paid private investigator and former Albuquerque police officer with a sordid past. Rice has no firsthand knowledge of the incident and was not involved in the initial investigation, yet he testified about both. That's usually the case with experts. Usually they don't have any firsthand knowledge, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, special, the special prosecutors intentionally withhold exculpatory evidence. So the stuff they say about experts not having firsthand knowledge is much ado about nothing because usually experts do not. I just really want to make that very clear. They keep making a big deal out of that, but that's not an issue. The other thing that they said that is an issue uh, would be not disclosing potential bias of the witnesses if they're if they are required to disclose exculpatory information, which they are here. And um this whole like sorted past thing, what do you mean by that? You know, I don't I don't know about that. Oh, they they've got a footnote about oh. the sorted past. Is that 18 or okay, 19. Yeah. Rice was in 2013. Rice was charged with beating a man as the man was surrendering during an arrest. Video from the arrest shows Rice punching the suspect in the face three times while another officer puts his boot on the suspect's head. Okay. Note the uh, note the headline. Santa officer Mexico. acquitted in beating case. You know what? I was even going to say like, okay, that's bad, but that doesn't necessarily go to his credibility here. It's bad, but unrelated, but, unrelated, also, he was but also he was acquitted. <laughs> so like, didn't do it. Oh like, my God. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Other than Hancock, Morrissey did not present any of the witnesses identified in Baldwin's alert letter. And I think that's a problem. And she didn't ask Hancock proper questions to elicit exculpatory information. Morrissey never contacted Baldwin's witnesses to ensure they were available to testify, even though the court ordered the state to make Baldwin's proposed witnesses readily available to testify without scheduling disruptions. The state knew it was obligated to do so, but it excluded those witnesses from the grand jury proceeding anyway. Okay. The state has accomplished this in two ways. First, Morrissey did not explain the meaning or purpose of Baldwin's alert letter to the grand jury. She introduced the letter at the beginning of the proceeding by stating simply, there is a grand jury alert letter from the target for your consideration. It, I don't see anything in the statute that she has to tell them the import of it. That's just that she has to tell it to them. She then yeah. proceeded to read the letter into the record verbatim without explaining its practical significance. Well, and anything else that she had said, they probably would have given grief about that, right? Yeah. Like, it's how do you explain the yeah. other side's alert letter in a way that doesn't get the other side upset? So, like... That you're qualifying mm -hmm. the letter in a way that helps the prosecution. Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I feel like it was better for her to just read it verbatim. And I would think that the law is not inclined to make them read it in a way that's helpful to the defense because it says for the defense to write the letter in such a way that is not argumentative, but is simply stating facts. So yeah. what is there to explain? You, sh you should have explained it in the letter. That was your obligation, I think. And it was just her obligation to present the letter to them and she read it to them. Now, not calling the witnesses that you requested, okay, that's that going to be, be, I think that's where they have some, you yeah. know, that's where I think there's some action to be had. But yeah, um, but she did the, the thing that the law said for her to do as far as the letter is concerned. And the problem is they put in so much like other crap oh. that I'm just like, you got to like, you got to pick your arguments. I want to see some bullet points. Here is what we requested. Here is what they did. Here is what they did not do. It violates this rule, this rule, and this rule. Please dismiss the indictment. Like, that's what yep. this motion needs. Because now it's so far afield. And Instead. it's it's getting mixed up with all sorts of, like, random other issues. Yeah. That I'm like, 
okay, is this, you know, is this one of these things that's already been dealt with? Like, because some of this, like, this goes back to before our the current prosecutor was even a prosecutor. So right, right, exactly. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna need to take a break after this page because my mouth is just so dry. <laughs> it's just so much word words. Instead, oh, there's Morrissey, way too many words. Way too many words. Morrissey conveyed the exact opposite impression. Before reading the alert letter, she had already dictated who the witnesses would be, informing the grand jury that this morning I will be presenting to you a case where Alexander Baldwin is the target. The witnesses in this case will be uh, Corporal Alexandra Hancock, Marissa Popple, Michael Hogg, Brian Carpenter, Ross Adiego, Lane Looper, and Connor Rice. I know I'm saying a lot of people's names wrong. I'm sorry. And after reading the alert letter into the record, Morrissey made no effort to explain the letter's purpose. She simply stated, this concludes the grand jury evidence alert letter from the target, so there are witnesses ready to testify now. However, if you, it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to take a break to consider the alert letter, or do you want to just begin hearing witnesses' testimony? Morrissey never explained or even attempted to explain what it meant for the grand jury to consider the alert letter i.e. that they could ask for any witness or document identified in the letter and, in fact, were required to order exculpatory evidence to be produced. Once again, her statement communicated that the opposite was true. Her message was the grand jury could consider the alert letter, read it to themselves, or just begin hearing witness testimony. I don't interpret that statement that way at all. That's not how I interpret that. That's a very negative reading of what she said. She said, do you want to consider the alert letter? I don't see anything in the statute saying she has to say, do you want to hear from any of these witnesses? You know, like, do yeah. you want to, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you want to hear from any of the things that are put in this alert? Do you want to consider the alert letter? That could mean them asking more questions about it, reading it more. That's a very loose and open, you know, statement. So I don't think that, I think that's a very ungenerous way to read that statement. Um. Yeah. The grand jury could consider the alert letter, hear witnesses the prosecution identified, and direct that the witnesses' testimony and documentary evidence identified in the alert letter be presented. After returning from a short break, the grand jurors asked about a few typos in the letter, making clear that the grand jurors had no idea what New Mexico law required them to consider about the alert letter. Okay, then maybe the law needs to change and they need to be directly, you know, instructed, but that's not what the law says. After discussing the typos, Morrissey stated that she can't fix the typos on the grand jury evidence alert letter because it's not ours. Again, conveying the impression that reading the letter was merely a formality. <laughs> no, that's not what she's saying at all. Before she commenced the actual hearing of evidence she wanted to present. I think that that's, a, again, a very ungenerous and misleading way to interpret what she's saying. She's just like, and, I can't. go ahead. Yeah, I just worry they're losing credibility with the court. Yeah. Like, they don't need they don't need to do this right here. I would have literally been like, we asked for these witnesses to be called and she never called the witnesses. Yeah. I feel like that's very strong. That's very strong. That could be enough, you know, to get it dismissed. But this right here, this is silly. Okay. Second, Morrissey diverted the grand jury from hearing exculpatory evidence as well as other evidence that would be helpful to Baldwin by refusing to facilitate the grand jury's repeated inquiries into the witnesses and documents identified in Baldwin's alert letter. This is a better issue if it's yeah. worn out. Much better. Instead of giving grand jurors the information they requested from the witnesses best able to provide it, Morrissey would redirect such inquiries to her own witnesses and further cement the notion that these were the only witnesses the grand jury had access to. For example, at one point during Hancock's testimony, a grand juror asked, so the bottom line is that the responsibility of making sure these guns, these bullets are not live or up to what David Halls and Hannah? The truthful answer to that question is yes. But rather than ask the grand juries if they jurors if they wanted to hear from Halls directly or inform them that this was an option, Morrissey responded, we are going to have another witness address those issues for you. We have an expert who works on movie sets and he's going to answer those questions for you if that's okay. The witness she was referring to was Carpenter, the state's paid expert whose false answer to that question, blaming the situation on Baldwin, would have been refuted by Halls. The relevant industry safety bulletin and SAG. Notably, at the trial of Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, one of the jurors has publicly stated that the jury's verdict was based on the fact that it was Gutierrez-Reed's job 
to check those rounds and those firearms. Even Morrissey agreed that that view at Gutierrez Reed's trial contradicted the false testimony she elicited for the grand jury. In summation at trial, Morrissey argued that Gutierrez Reed is the autonomous decision maker with regard to gun safety and that Gutierrez Reed was responsible for Hutchins' death because it was foreseeable that Baldwin would not check the gun. When another grand juror asked, shouldn't somebody have seen the difference before it went into the gun? Morrissey again deflected the question away from Halls, who previously testified that he should have checked the gun before handing it to Baldwin. Instead, she stated, like I said, we're going to have more testimony on this that hopefully will help with that. At no point did Morrissey explain to grand jurors that they could hear from Halls directly if they wanted. I think that this is a better issue. Morrissey later introduced testimony that Baldwin could have determined the difference between a dummy and a blank without any basis for that testimony and contrary to what at least one other person on set told the SFSO. He said, you wouldn't be able to tell off of a visual inspection if there are dummies and live rounds. And that's from Ackles. On another occasion, a grand juror asked when Alec Baldwin refused to look at the gun that was handed that was allegedly cleared and they gave it to him to re-inspect it, how would he inspect the gun? Would he would he take all the bullets out into his hand and start shaking them? Or would he just open the chamber and look at the top, make sure it was the kind of seated all the same and no inconsistencies? The question itself is troubling because it reflects at least three material misunderstandings. Number one, that Baldwin refused to look at the gun. Number two, yeah, I don't think I hear any evidence of that. Before. Yeah, that's not going to fly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> two, that he was required to re-inspect it once it was handed to him. And three, that there is a protocol for actors on how to check weapons. Maybe there should be. <laughs> These misunderstandings are the direct result of false testimony from Morrissey's witnesses. And Morrissey had a duty to elicit truthful evidence to rebut them. For example, had the grand jury been able to question halls or been referred to affidavits about the accident, the correct safety bulletin or SAG's official views, the grand jury would have understood that Baldwin didn't refuse to check or reinspect the gun. Rather, he had no obligation to check it in the first place and therefore was never asked or told to check the gun or given the protocol for doing so. But Morrissey diverted that inquiry stated, is it okay with you if we address that question to a different witness? Again, she was referring to Carpenter, whose false testimony would compound the grand juror's misunderstanding. In fact, Carpenter testified at the trial that Gutierrez, Reed, and Halls, not the actor, have the obligation to check and clear the gun. I remember that testimony, which is the opposite of what he falsely told the Baldwin grand jury. Very interesting. Um, Carpenter testifying. Well, see, I'm saying so. The issue with that is I don't think that that's a function of the prosecutor necessarily doing anything wrong. The witness is just testifying um, inconsistently, and you can use that at the trial. However, if you had another witness that was also an expert that would say the opposite, or Halls who would say the opposite, then did you have an obligation to present that to the jury? And it sounds like they did. Anybody that wants to see it, it gets clear with them if they request, but generally it's going to be your first AD and possibly the DP as well. Morrissey, are you testifying that you show the individual dummy rounds to the AD and whoever else wants to see? Carpenter, absolutely. Morrissey, and the actor? Carpenter, the actor may or may not be on set yet, but when they get there, this is done again. So with the actor, and sometimes you'll have an actor and says, nah, I don't want to see it. And they'll just brush it off. But as long as you've done your safety check with at least two other sources and move through that process, then you've done what you should have done. Morrissey, and whose responsibility is it to ferret out any possible live rounds on a movie set? Carpenter, it's the armorer's responsibility. Morrissey did not present that critical exculpatory evidence to the grand jury, and she was so determined to keep Halls out of the picture that she cut off her own witnesses if their testimony focused on issues where Halls' statement or conduct would exculpate Baldwin. Morrissey, now you've seen this video. Is there anything about that, you about what you've seen here, problematic from your standpoint? A Diego, yes. Morrissey, what is it? A Diego, there's a number of things. First of all, as soon as the Mr. Baldwin emptied that firearm and we had to reload, Dave Hall could have called cut to give everybody that moment for safety reset. I, it appears as though the armorer is putting spent ammo in the same fanny pack or pouch as live ammo as she's pulling live ammo out of. Dave Hall's, the first AD who's in blue jeans and a black shirt is not Morrissey interrupted and keep in mind. Oh, that's interesting. We're here for Mr. Baldwin point your, your narrative. What is Mr. Baldwin doing in this scene? What that was concerning you. 
So he was trying to point to, and here's what David Halls is doing wrong. And she's like, uh-uh, <laughs> go back to Baldwin. <laughs> Although Halls did have a level of responsibility here and has actually taken a deal. So I'm going to take the, a break. The thing yeah. is, is that, is that improper for, because mm -hmm. Baldwin is the, like, is the action on that one. Right. So, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because I, her question is, yeah, yeah. Did, I mean, he's the one she's indicting, so. Um, Morrissey also steered grand jurors away from other critical witnesses identified in Baldwin's alert letter. While Rice, Morrissey, while, while Rice, Morrissey's paid private investigator, was testifying, a juror made a direct inquiry about Sarah Zachary's responsibility. Looking back at the alert letter, there's a notation that Sarah Zachary, the prop master for the film, was also the supervisor of Han for Hannah Reed, but nobody's talking about her play in this, so you know where I'm going. In response, Morrissey indicated that Rice may not be familiar enough with the relationship between the prop master and the armorer to answer the question, but Morrissey stated, we have a witness sitting out there who may be able to answer it. The witness should have been Zachary, who made exculpatory statements on this topic. Instead, it was Lane Looper, whom Morrissey offered to bring back to answer the grand jurors' questions. Should have been is like, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of this is real subjective because it's like, I think they're allowed to present their case, but then should they also have called and now this person's going to say something different? You know, like, I, I don't know. I don't know. This is all yeah. so new to me. Hold on, yeah. babe. Um, Can you come get DJ, please? Thank you. I, I wanted to go to the bathroom before bed. And no the point. Pup, uh, chew, not chew at all the things. No, he's he's an older guy, so he's chilling. He's just walking around. <laughs> Look, he's such a good boy. Go, daddy. Go, daddy. Come on. Oh, here comes Jazz on her bullshit. Jazz, be calm. And Jazz can stay. And then you can just take DJ. She likes her, him. She likes him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, babe. Um, okay. At no point during the exchange, did Morrissey explained that Zachary herself was available to testify and that other witnesses who had communicated with Zachary about this issue could testify. Morrissey was obligated to present these witnesses if the grand jury wished to hear from them or that the grand jury had no obligation to request, had an obligation to request evidence that might be exculpatory or favorable to Baldwin. As a result of Morrissey's diversions, the grand jury never heard from the film's director, Joel Souza, its producer, Ryan Smith, its first assistant director, Dave Hall, or its prop master, Sarah Zachary, even though each of these witnesses had exculpatory testimony that would have satisfied the grand jury's inquiries in ways that Morrissey's paid and attenuated witnesses could not. But rather than facilitate the grand jury's inquiry into Baldwin's witnesses, Morrissey did everything in her power to ensure that the grand jury never heard from them. Morrissey also withheld dozens of exculpatory documents that were relevant to the grand jury's inquiries and contained specific answers to many of their questions. Okay. <laughs> this, I, I just, I feel like that was their strongest argument. Those, those two bullet points to me, those two sections were their strongest arguments. What do you think? Yeah. And the, the problem is, is it's like you mix in good arguments with really petty crap. Yeah. And it loses credibility. Yep. I mean, I would have just said they should have called these witnesses. Had they called right. these witnesses, you know, the, the jury asked this question. This could have been addressed by our witness, mm -hmm. but without the, like, they had to do this kind of thing, right? So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah I, I really do wish that they had stuck to brass tacks here and um, because I think they might have done Baldwin himself a disservice because it does sound like the law would require the presentation of those witnesses and they were not presented and the court made several rulings that were pretty clear. And so that I think is pretty cut and dry, but then they get into all this other stuff that muddies the waters. So we'll yeah. see. Um, see the special prosecutor issues and pro I'm getting tired of this by the way, guys. So I'm going to cut. Oh, this it's, it's obnoxious. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think I'll make, I'll make, uh, let's see. Where does the C? This is not, this is not the argument. 
We'll make no. it to the argument. We'll make it to the <laughs> argument and then we're done. I'm not, I'm not, because this isn't, <laughs> is, if this is the facts, the facts are so argumentative. I thought we were in the argument. They're not yeah. just saying. Oh, no. Then... <laughs> Ian, I'm going to lose my mind. I cannot believe that this is not the argument. Okay. <laughs> Morrissey supercharged these failures by issuing an improper instruction on a critical element of the charging statute. Specifically, on three separate occasions, Morrissey instructed the jury, the grand jury, that to return a true bill or an indictment under New Mexico 14-231, it must find probable cause as to each of the following elements. Number one, the target discharged a firearm during the production of the movie without first verifying the firearm contained no live ammunition and while the firearm was pointed in the direction of another. Two, the target should have known the danger involved from the firearm's actions. And three, the target acted with a willful disregard for the safety of others. The targets, four, the targets act caused the death of Helena Hutchins. Morrissey included the italicized language, even though she had successfully argued to the court that Baldwin's request and instruction concerning subjective knowledge was improper because it assumes that the factual basis of a negligent act was failing to check for the firearm of live rounds and that any deviation from the pattern instructions by inserting such language was unwarranted. The instruction Morrissey gave to the grand jury deviates from the pattern and violates the court's order. It also places an affirmative duty on Baldwin to check the gun for live bullets well, maybe he does have an affirmative duty to check the gun for life. I don't know. Obtain subjective knowledge about the very thing that Morrissey told the grand jury's jury court has nothing to do with the ways in which the state intends to prove Baldwin's negligence. In which the state expert at Gutierrez Reed trial, Carpenter testified, was not the actor's responsibility. So basically they were like, you no take backsies. You said that we couldn't <laughs> use a subjective standard as an exculpatory instruction, but as an inculpatory instruction, you use a subjective standard and that's not a part of the pattern instructions. And that is unfair. And you should not have done that. And I'm ending it there, Ian, unless there's some part of it that you want to highlight, but I'm done. No, it's, just, it's, too it's, much. it's too long. I feel like this is not great writing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's better than what Bowles has done, mm -hmm. but Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, no, no, no. I think that I think that they're good litigators. I can tell already. First of all, I like this. File a motion to dismiss the indictment. You know what I'm saying? I like a, a lot of litigation leading up to a criminal case, especially where someone's deceased. You know, I want to see that you're working hard for your client. But this motion, it needs to be edited. <laughs> it is extremely needs to be edited because they're getting into things that this court cannot even act upon. Can't act upon the things that the former prosecutors did that they were sanctioned for you can only act upon the things that these prosecutors did in this action. So I don't know. All right. Yeah. It's I, I mean, if I'm the judge, I'm a little pissed off about having to, uh, you know, having to read this. Yeah. But if I, if I look at it from another perspective, forget how, too much this motion is um there may have been a pattern throughout this entire case from the moment of the shooting in which baldwin was treated unfairly by the prosecution because they lost their heads with the publicity around it maybe they don't personally like baldwin and so they said some crazy things got kicked off the case. Now you have a new set of prosecutors and then they're trying to do things like shorten time standards and exclude his evidence. And thereby he's not being, being, he's not been given due process as all the other citizens of New Mexico or people being prosecuted in New Mexico are receiving. And so the specter of that is highly concerning and maybe the judge would overlook the stylistic errors and the um, media courting on the part of the defense to say that this prosecution should be dismissed because of these violations of the statute. But it is still rare for an indictment to be dismissed. That's the nuclear option, but I'm not sure what other remedies the court could come up with. I think those are my kind of final thoughts on having read that. What do you think? I think what the court will probably come back with is, listen, um, this is, um, you know, some of this, maybe they should have done a little better. Mm -hmm. Your remedy is that we will point our finger at the prosecution and say, do better next time. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and off mm -hmm. you go to trial. Yeah. Um, these are all good. And these are all good issues for trial. There's things that they raise. And I'm like, no, that's a good point. That'll be an interesting issue to play out in front of a jury. But usually it's not to dismiss the whole indictment. But there is precedent for it to happen. They cited one case in which the indictment was dismissed because of a failure to present the exculpatory evidence. So I'm not sure how frequently that happens, Ian. But it at least happened once. We will see. I yeah. mean, this is a kind of unique trial. It is. All right. If you're down, I'm going to go through the 15 super chats that I have. Um, but if not, do you want to sign yourself out or do you want to sit through them in case some people have some questions for you? I will sign myself out. I'm kind of rocking. Um, I managed to pick up uh, COVID. So I'm kind of rocking the exhaustion oh, on no. that. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you're so great for coming on. Even I have no idea. What are you doing? Go to bed. Everybody go subscribe to Runkle of the Bailey. What the heck? <laughs> You're all oh, it's, subscribed. I was just like, I want I want to come on and talk yeah, about this because yeah. it's been forever. And also this is um this is such a wild case. And it's it gonna be um uh, I mean, unless it gets thrown out, it's gonna continue to be wild. So yeah, agreed. Um we'll agreed. see. If it does get thrown out, though, a lot of people on Law Tube, probably myself included, will be very disappointed. Oh. So <laughs> yeah, you know, before you go, I think there's I I still don't know how I feel about this case. This is one of the cases in which I have very little emotional investment in it. And I don't know why that is. I, I care very much about Miss Hutchins being killed. I care very, very much about that. But maybe Gutierrez Reed being convicted, but also me feeling kind of sorry for her because I felt like she was too inexperienced to have that role and no one should have hired her for it. And she wasn't mature enough. I felt a little sorry for her too. I just kind of feel like, uh, about this case. Like there's, there's just no winners in this case as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And I'm, uh, I, I think that it's very good that, uh, Hannah faced charges and was convicted. I think that mm -hmm. she deserved that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Baldwin. I mean, I, I think he should be convicted in a perfect world in the sense that I don't think that anybody should be handling a firearm without sufficient knowledge to be sure that they're being safe with it. Mm -hmm. I don't think he will. I don't think he's going to be, um, I, I suspect he's going to walk and there's just, um, too many of the prosecutor's witnesses are mm -hmm. now going to be burned because they went hard for Hannah Mm -hmm. and it's going to be hard for them to pivot in a way that doesn't get them slaughtered. Yeah. Um, like you and I, we both do criminal defense. We know how great it is when a prosecution's witness has given two different state, like two statements. Oh yeah. Like Carpenter. Yeah. Carpenter's mm -hmm. given two state, like all of them have these, you know, and it's not just a statement. It's a, they've testified under oath about all of these details. Right. So anything they get wrong, you could just be like, and we're going to, you know, so those, cro we're going to see some cross examinations that I think will just be absolute slaughters. Mm -hmm. And that'll be, uh, that'll be interesting. So this might be a real fun trial to watch. Mm -hmm. And, um, We'll have to if see. It gets but... the trial. Okay. Well, Ian, right. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, you for having me. And, uh, Bailey. We uh, we also need to do another Hot Ones challenge sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> do they have a new flight out yet? I think they do. So okay, good, good. Me, I you, and um, Rob. Me, you, and Lawn Lumber. Yep, and yeah. I think uh, that should be a lot of fun because um, I'm excited. Yeah, they're they're good. Also, yeah. I. Should um, I need to figure out a way to sneak you some of, uh, the U S doesn't, I don't have the sort of FDA certificate to get uh -huh. them into the U S properly, Yeah, but I still need to find a way to sneak you some of my hot sauce. So I'm so excited. I've been <laughs> waiting to try it. I'm so, so excited. All right. I, I want your take on it, but, uh, okay. all right. Catch you later. See you later. Okay. Bye. All right, guys, let's get to the super chats.
Megan Runzer, welcome to the Lawyer Chick List. Brandy Bradley has been a member for three months. Natalie and Runkle, yay! J. Michael Arvin, thank you for gifting 50 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. The Nick C, welcome to the Lawyer Chick List. Morgan has been a member for 10 months and says, love a Natalie and Runkle collab, as do I. Thanks, guys. Marvin CZ gifted 10 Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. Thank you ever so much. Ryan Blackhawk gifted five Natalie Lawyer Chick memberships. Thank you very, very much. Laura Christine, welcome to the Lawyer Chicklets. Christine Pantier, welcome to the Lawyer Chicklets. Octo Nation, the largest octopus fan club. Thank you for the $5 super sticker. Lady F and T, hey, my girl, member for eight months. Love a person who loves fur babies. I do. I love animals in all their iterations. Well, I'm just a softie. I love animals and children and everything. I, I love anything that's cute. <laughs> Aaron, thank you for the super chat. Delphi has data showing other people at the crime scene at the time of the murder. L.E. lost all videos of interviews with those people. Please look. I have covered the Delphi murders multiple times and also the evidence that is potentially exonerating of, is it Richard Allen? Is that his name of Richard Allen? And I really do need to catch up on that, but I, I don't know if what I covered in my last Delphi murders live stream would cover what you're talking about. So go check that out and let me know because I am highly, highly interested in the progress of that case. Those alternative suspects, like the people that were maybe Odinists or something, just very, very interesting to me. Extremely interesting. You know, it's a possibility that they have the wrong guy. I'm not sure, but there is a possibility. Equality, thank you so much for this $5 Canadian super chat. I'm so sad I missed so much of the stream. That's okay. You're here now and I can't stay. Love you guys. You two are so respectful and always have great discussions as do I. Marvin CZ, thank you so much for the super chat. Um, is CZK Czech Republic? <laughs> what is CZK? Hold on. I always like to find out what the denominations are. Hold on. Who wants one? Who wants one? Who wants one? CZK currency. You guys are yelling it at me right now. Mm. Uh, Czech Corona. What is the CZK? Oh, it's the Czech Republic. I was right. Okay. See, <laughs> thank you, Mar Marvin. I would love to see the cross of the SAG person if Baldwin calls them. Why the change? Why did you remove a layer of safety after this incident? Such a good question. Why all of a sudden is it not the, or is it so clear that it's not the art, the actor's responsibility? That's a really, really, really good question. All right, my friends, I want to thank you so, so much for joining me. If you have not subscribed, please become a subscriber. Please make sure that you like the video on your way out and I will see you in the next one. Bye. Stream over.